Welcome everyone to the um, Adult Social Care and Communities Member Induction um, Session. Um, we've got some um, good presentations today um, and we're going to um, start the proceedings by the chairman, I think, um, asking everyone to introduce um, yourselves as a, a new committee. Um, I'm just going to um, explain that when we go through the presentations and the reports, um, the um, the report will be presented, noted. Any questions, we would request that you, um, on the bottom of your screen, um, press the uh, smiley face symbol and try to um, hit the raised hand button, which indicates that you want to ask a question. If you struggle to do that, if you wave your hand in front of the screen, um, the chairman, Councillor Stephen Hurst and myself will, will try to um, make sure that everybody is able to ask questions in the order um, that we see them. Um, I now will pass you over to Councillor Stephen Hurst to welcome to the to the session. Thanks, Joe, and welcome to uh, the first Adult Social Care and Communities Scrutiny Committee of this Council session. Um, you may well have already realised just how wide-ranging adult social care and the community work is, and we want to gently um, introduce you to the complications and the of adult social care. It's not um, an easy thing and it's such an important aspect of the of the county council's work. Um, I hope that you've all read the papers. Some of them are quite detailed and hope that you're able to ask questions of, of those things which we are not particularly clear on. As I said before, good scrutiny is based on applying professional searching attitude to the subject in hand. And I'm sure that we can all employ these principles so that we all benefit from being um, members of this very important scrutiny committee. So without any more ado, um, I'd like to ask, we introduce everyone to everyone else. So if I could ask members and officers to briefly introduce themselves in a very short um, one or two lines, I'd be very much obliged. We'll start off with members. Who have we got here, Joe? I think if I go, if I call, if I just um, sort of call in the order of, of my list and then it'll, it'll help the process. Um, if we start with, with Alistair. Alistair, are you there? Alistair Chambers. I don't think Alistair's there. Okay, we'll move quickly on. Uh, Kate, Kate, do you want to just give a, a, a line or two just to, to introduce yourself to the committee? Hi, I'm Kate. I'm in Tewkesbury. I'm a town councillor, borough councillor and newly elected um, county councillor. Uh, Thank you. Mark? I'm Kate. Mark. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mark McKenzie Charrington, good morning. Um, I'm the newly elected member for the Stowe Division. Thank you. Uh, Lisa? Hello, uh, I'm Lisa Spivey. I am a district councillor, cultural district council, where I'm also a cabinet member for housing and homelessness. And I am the newly elected uh, uh, member for the South Cerny Division. Wonderful. Welcome, Thank Lisa. You. Welcome. Pam, Councillor Pam Tracy. Would you like to introduce yourself, Pam? In, a one, in just a short line. I think you're muted at the moment. Are you muted, Pam? Good morning, everyone. And nice to see you all. And welcome. And uh, yeah, I'm Pam Tracy. I'm a city county councillor. I'm, I'm a city county councillor for Mornings, Linden and Westgate. I'm Podsmead and, and um, city councillor. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Terry, Terry Hale. Morning all, nice to see your faces. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm county councillor for Drybrook, Liberal in the Forest of Dean, and this was my second term uh, as uh, I was re-elected uh, for that area. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and Steve, Steve Robinson. Yeah, good morning all. Um, Steve Robinson, county councillor for Nailsworth Division, I've been re-elected this time. 
and I'm also chair of Stray District Council and I'm a town councillor in Ellsworth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think Councillor Suzanne Williams is with us. Suzanne, are you there? Um, I don't think so. That's fine. Um, cabinet members, I think it would be useful to just introduce cabinet members. Carol Alloway Martin. Good morning, members of the committee. Um, Carol Alloway Martin, I'm cabinet member for Adult Social Care Commissioning. Um, I represent Colford Division in the Forest of Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Cathy, Cathy Williams. Good morning, everybody. Um, I represent Long Levens in Gloucester. I'm also a city councillor for Long Levens and I'm adult social care service delivery and I work in partnership with Carol. We work together just about everything. Thank you. Councillor Tim Harmon. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome again to new members. I haven't had a chance to say hello to in person yet. So Councillor Tim Harmon representing Lansdowne and Park in Cheltenham. I'm also a member of Cheltenham Borough Council and I'm a member for public health and communities. Thank you, Tim. And Councillor Dave Norman. Good morning, everybody. Councillor Dave Norman, uh, Cabinet Member for Public Protection, Parking and Libraries, and Division Member for Grange and Kingsway, which is part of Gloucester. Thank you, Dave. Um, I think that's everyone. Um, I think you all know Councillor Stephen Hurst. Um, on to, moving on to Officer Sarah, do you, I'm sure everybody knows you, Sarah, but I do want to just uh, say a quick hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Scott. I'm the Executive Director for Adult Social Care and Public Health. Thank you. Siobhan? Hi there, uh, I'm Siobhan Farmer. I'm Deputy Director for Public Health in Sarah's team. Thank you. I don't think Colin's with us. Colin, are you there? Colin Chick? I think he's no, joining us. No, he'll be joining us in a little while. I think um, Jane, you're, um, Jane is from um, Colin's team. Jane, do you want to say a quick hello? Good morning, everybody. I'm Jane Everest. I'm Head of Libraries and Registration Services. And Philip Williams will be joining us later as well from Colin's team. Um, and Kelly, Kelly, Hadley, we're, I'm really pleased Kelly's here to just talk about the performance process. Kelly? Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, my name's Kelly Headley, and I'm the Performance and Improvement Officer for the County Council. Brilliant, thank you. And Mark, Mark Priest. Good morning, Joe, and uh, good morning, councillors. Mark Priest, I'm the Chief Officer for your fire service, and I'm also the di wider director for the Community Safety Directorate, which includes um, civil protection, trading standards, and coroners. So, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I see that Councillor Suzanne Williams has joined us. Good morning, Suzanne. Do you want to just say a quick hello and just um, say which division you're from? Good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yeah, good. Yeah, um, I'm in Springbank, Hester, Hester's Way Springbank in Cheltenham. Thank you. Sorry I'm a bit late. I was running around with dog and husband and all sorts of things going on this morning. But thank you. <laughs> Not a all problem. Right, you. Nice to see you. Thank you. OK, Stephen, back to yourself now. And the lady who was carrying out that introduction is, is Joe Moore, who is our very valuable <laughs> member of Democratic Services and helps us no end very often. So, Thank Joe, you, Stephen. would you mind just going through the terms of reference yeah. of the committee, please? And just before I just go through the terms of reference, I will explain, and I think Sarah will agree, and Colin would agree if I, if he was um, with us at the moment, is that there is um, quite a little bit of overlap between the scrutiny committees. That you have um, some areas that infringe on other areas. Certainly, with this committee, adult social care and communities. Um, and the um, Health Scrutiny Committee, there's certain aspects that do overlap. Um, and I do try, and Sarah um, uh, helps me there in um, highlighting papers from the HOS Committee um, that might be relevant to this committee. Um, and Sarah very kindly um, presents to the HOS Committee. Um, so from time to time, we will bring to your attention um, maybe the dates of other meetings or the papers from other meetings that you might need to refer to. Um, similarly, with um, environment scrutiny, um, there's a little bit of overlap there with this committee. Um, we do look at um, some aspects of the infrastructure um, sort of uh, uh, director um, services. Um, but we do have a little bit of overlap. So some on some occasions, I will be pointing you to environment papers. 
we've had a recent change, and I think Mark's going to go through this um, a little bit later. We've had a recent change with the new council in that um, the fire service, scrutiny of the fire service was covered under the remit of this committee. It is no longer. We now have a fire scrutiny committee that have uh, taken all things relating to um, delivery of the Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service, as in fire related issues that will now be covered um, separately. Um, I think you've all had um, the terms of reference uh, provided to you, and I'm not going to go through them in detail because there's quite a lot there, and you'll find that the terms of reference are covered in all of the reports that you, you'll be uh, noting today. Um, so now I'm going to pass you back to, um, to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, yes, today is... Um... An informal um, familiarization. That takes a bit of saying sometimes. Familiarization um, session where we all um, should be asking questions and scrutinizing that which we're not 100% sure about. So that will be the theme of, of this morning. The first serious meeting of the committee is in about a fortnight. Is that not so, Joe? The first proper committee is on the 6th of July, um, so we've got a very quick turnaround. You should be getting papers for that meeting um, no later than Monday of next week. The, the publication day is Monday, so it is unusual, um, but this session today will hopefully um, prepare you for the meeting on the 6th of July. It's a bit of a harem scare and um, introduction to the, the, the current council. But we'll get through it. We're all done in a calm and measured manner. But first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Sarah Scott, um, who is our Director of Adult Social Care and Public Health, who has been working her socks off during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And we're all very grateful, Sarah, for the work that you and your team are doing. So first, Sarah, your report, please. Thanks, Stephen. And I've, I've, I have an absolutely amazing team, so um, I couldn't have done any of this without them. So um, it's not just me, I assure you. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, so there are two reports for me on, on the, this part of the agenda. So just by way of a bit of background, I've been the Director of Public Health here for over six years now. And on the 1st of January this year, I took on the Adult Social Care portfolio as well. So um, I've always brought a public health update report to this scrutiny committee, but in order to give adequate time for scrutiny of both parts of my portfolio, I intend to keep them separate for you. So today you've got um, an introductory report into what is public health and prevention in Gloucestershire, and then um, we've got uh, what is adult social care. I think I've got that in the right order, haven't I, Joe? Yeah, Joe's nodding at me. So um, the first report then talks you through what is public health and I'm assuming you've read the papers so I'll just talk to you some of the, the salient points. So it talks about um, who we are and what we are and how we managed to end up in the council because we were in the NHS for, for quite a number of years. We were brought here by the Health and Social Care Act. I do firmly believe that we are in the right place. I think public health being in the local authority we're much more able to influence and um, what we call the wise determinants of health and to have a bigger influence. So I've worked here since just before transition in um, December 2012. So we have a budget collectively of around £35 million to um, carry out the public health functions prescribed in the Health and Social Care Act and some wider prevention functions. So the paper talks a little bit about um, some of the, the needs across the system um, and this is a very, very short snapshot on that first couple of pages. But the bit I'd like to dwell on for a little, for a little while is around our role in prevention and tackling health inequalities. So this is absolutely central to everything we do in um, my team called the, called the Prevention Wellbeing and Communities Hub, so, and, and that includes the public health function. So health inequalities are um, avoidable and they're unfair and they're unjust differences in people's um, health and well-being across different population groups. The first key report was the Black Report published in the early 1980s about inequalities and we're still seeing inequalities now in 2021. Um, and I think there's a definition here on page two of your paper, but basically they're differences that we've documented between different population groups. Um, so sometimes people fall into more than one category, so they could be around people's socioeconomic status and, and, and the level of deprivation they experience. It could be around protected characteristics, so their, their gender, their age, whether they've got a disability, their sexual orientation. It could be because they're in a vulnerable group. Um, 
or inclusion health groups, things like um, vulnerable migrants, gypsies, travellers um, and uh, communities, rough sleepers and the homeless. And also it can be because of where you live. We see inequalities in between different areas in the county. So because of the importance of tackling inequalities, this is one of the central tenets of the um, health and wellbeing strategy for the county and is also one of the four um, key areas of priority for our health system as well. So here we talk a lot about inequalities. Every year I'm required to produce um, an independent report of the Director of Public Health and that will focus on one aspect of tackling inequalities. So for example last year we looked at the inequalities that Covid had brought about for um, uh, ethnic minority communities in Gloucestershire. The year before we looked at the connection between health and wealth and the inequalities associated with that. They're all on the County Council website if, you, if you're interested in having a look and we'll be publishing this year's report in around sort of October, November time. So the report then goes on to talk a bit about prevention and some of the work around um, inequalities during COVID and how that really exacerbated those inequalities. And now we're hopefully moving past towards the end of that acute pandemic phase, looking to get back to some of the more traditional work around tackling inequalities. Briefly mentions the budget and then talks about our mandated functions. So when public health was um, cheapened out of the NHS into local government, the Health and Social Care Act, um, prescribe some mandated functions of all public health teams across um, upper tier local authorities in England. So we must provide, the County Council must provide accessible, appropriate sexual health services. Um, we have a health protection assurance function. So prior to COVID, our health protection work was actually quite a small part of our job. I think it's been, it's taken over um, our lives, hasn't it, Siobhan, for the past 16 months. And we were really only providing an assurance function. So we, our statutory role was to be assured there are plans in place to protect the health of the population. And we've gone way beyond that. And as Siobhan will go into in, in, in her um, item that she's presenting in terms of what we've actually delivered on behalf of our population. Um, we were required to provide um, support, public health support and advice to NHS commissioners to ensure that they were able to commission their services um, adequately. So we've been doing a lot of work with the clinical commissioning group for the last eight years. We also commission what we call the National Child Measurement Programme, where we weigh and measure children in reception in year six. Um, we commission a service to ensure that everyone who is eligible aged between 40 and 70 is invited for an NHS health check um, once every five years. And then a couple of years later, they added to this list and we are now responsible for um, commissioning health services health visiting services. So these are these um, mandated um, five points of contact for children aged between birth and five. So alongside that, we provide a whole myriad of and, and permission, a myriad of different services um, for our population. And what the paper does is talk you through some of these. So public mental health, um, there's always a lot of interest in this. This sits alongside the mental health work that's commissioned from the NHS, but how we essentially ensure good levels of mental well-being rather than services to treat mental ill health. And um, there's a brief explanation there in the paper. We also lead the work on suicide prevention in the county. Um, sexual health, as I mentioned, is a mandated service. And this was quite a peculiar service to bring to the local authority in 2013. So um, it's quite a broad service that we commission. So if you go and have a sexually transmitted infection diagnosed, that will be a service that we um, commission. Um, we also commission additional contraceptive services uh, in primary care with, from GPs. We commission all the services around provision of free condoms um, to all of our at-risk groups. So you'll see there it's quite a, a detailed service. We commission services around domestic abuse um, and there are a whole range of different services there for people experiencing domestic abuse um, and perpetrators as well. Drug and alcohol services. Again, this is another quite complex area and one of our biggest areas of spend. So anything from experiencing some issues with perhaps drinking a little bit too much to um, residential rehab for opiate addiction and everything in between. Um, we have a prescription bill, for example, of, of around one or two million pounds a year for our um, for our services. So we pay for quite a lot of what you might deem to be clinical treatment, which is not necessarily something people expect to see from from a council. The next area we, we focus on is something called supporting people. Now, supporting people was the government policy area quite some years ago, but it's something I think that is, is a term that people are very aware of. And this is about how we provide housing for people in vulnerable circumstances. And um, the, the, the technical name for it is accommodation and community-based support services. Um, and we have brought um, quite a few updates on this and it's relation to homelessness and rough sleeping over the years. 
Healthy Lifestyles is a service that's traditionally associated with public health, so how we help people achieve a healthy weight, to be more physically active, achieve moderate levels of drinking and stop smoking. Uh, and there's a whole, um, we, we've got a, we, an excellent service provider that, that helps us deliver all that. And there's some more detail there in the paper. So children's public health, I've already mentioned the public health nursing service. This includes health visiting for the 0 to 5s and school nursing for the school age children. Um, we also work very, very closely with the colleagues in children's services and the commissioners to um, implement the, the developing um, Gloucestershire children's strategy. Um, and we've also, under the auspices of the Health and Wellbeing Board, established a programme called Adverse Childhood Experiences. And the name is quite confusing because actually it, it relates to children, but also as much to adults as it does to children. So we've done a lot of work around how we can um, understand what happened to people as children and adults and then help them overcome their trauma. I mentioned we give advice to the CCG. There's a section in there on that. Um, and the next section talks about enabling active communities and individuals. Now, this I would call this one of our enabling functions. Um, we have we are an uh, intelligence data evidence driven function. So we um, try and ensure that whatever we do is either based on some evidence of effectiveness or if it's not, then we've got an evaluation in, in, in place to be able to understand what it, it, it's what we're doing actually having the, the desired in, uh, impact. And what we've learned through the years is that doing two people doesn't work. You have to work alongside people. And this might seem incredibly obvious, but I th still think in lots of services across our system, we are very good at doing two people. So the Enabling Active Communities and Individuals programme is really around how we can best work across our system with the voluntary and community sector and individuals themselves to understand, well, how can we understand what your needs are? What would actually make things better for you? And how can we involve you in that decision making? And we, we spend £35 million a year just in this particular team commissioning services. So how can we make sure they are user led and, and that they are what people really need? Health protection, as I mentioned, this used to be a relatively small part of our role. Um, and in, in the report here, it talks about some of the other non-COVID things that we've done, um, mainly picking up some of the more preventative work. We've done work around avian flu. We did a huge amount of work around um, planning for a flu pandemic. Some of that was really helpful in terms of COVID and certainly in terms of the relationships that we've built up. And um, some of our planning assumptions did help in the early days. But I think what really did help is the fact that we all know each other really well across Gloucestershire, from the police, the district councils, local health colleagues, fire and across the council. And that certainly helped in the, in the early days of, of the pandemic when, when things were incredibly busy. Um, so I won't touch on COVID because Siobhan's going to cover that. So um, and then the rest of the paper talks about well, what, what are we going to do going forward? We've also put some data in at the end, um, just around sort of a very short Gloucestershire health profile, but it does lead you to our what we call our joint strategic needs assessment. So we're, the Health and Wellbeing Board is required to have a strategy and a joint strategic needs assessment. This is on a website called Inform Gloucestershire. It contains lots of information at various different levels. So right down from ward level all the way up to county level. And it's got lots of themed information on there. So, for example, there's a children's needs assessment on there. Everything we do in, in public health, we publish on there. So it, this, the end of the document basically talks you through a bit of a, a, a mini health profile. So I'll stop there. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, I shall just have a little quick look and see if there's any raised hands. Are there any members who would like to ask um, any questions on Sarah's um, public health report. Um, Mark, Mark McKenzie, do you want to ask a quick question? A question? Thank you. Um, not actually to ask a question, but just to say, Sarah, I found your report humbling. I didn't understand really what this committee was all about. And uh, my goodness, it opens one's eyes as to the responsibilities that uh, County Council has, and we as uh, councillors, the responsibility that we have to uh, to the community, and I just found it fascinating, and I'm sure that uh, it will continue to be more, you know, more, more and more so as, as, as I get involved, but um, it was really just to say thank you, I thought it was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. That's very good. And any other questions at all? Could, could I ask the committee a question, if there aren't any questions, Joe? Yeah, Chair? can I, just Joe, can oh. I talk? Yeah. Sorry, Terry. Yeah, just one thing. Can I? Can you explain, or, or uh, 
give me the figures of how many of our nurses and our workers in the care homes have been uh, had the jab. I don't know whether this is the right time to bring it up, but you know, it seems to be a hot topic at the moment. And and what would our criteria be for uh, enforcing that issue of of uh, of our care staff having to have the jab and also our nurses and, and paramedics? Okay, so I haven't got the data to hand on the nursing and NHS staff. Um, we'd have to go to NHS colleagues for that. Um, I think, Siobhan, do you have the data in your report? So it might be better we ask Siobhan to cover that, actually. Do you want to do that now, Siobhan? Yeah, I can do, Sarah. So um, at the time of writing the report, obviously... Ah. Oh, oh, no. Is she frozen? <laughs> What dreadful timing! <laughs> we'll just if wait a want, second. If, if she wants to come back, I can answer it. I'll just try and find the the right page. Sometimes we have a little dip, and um, hopefully, Siobhan's going to come back. Um, there have been some issues with Webex today. A lot of my team have had difficulty getting in. Would you like me to answer that? I can. Yes, please. Okay. Oh. Right. So. Um, I've just found the right page. So when the report was written, so this was a good seven to 10 days ago, it was finalised. In older adult care homes, we'd vaccinated 84.7% of staff. Um, and the England average, the England data was 83.5. So we're slightly above the England rate. And in younger adult care homes, we had vaccinated 81.4% of staff and the England average was 79.8. So we're doing okay. There's always always improvements to be made. I think you might have seen in the news that there were moves to make um, care the vaccination mandatory for care home staff. So up until now, I think that we have been working very hard with um, local NHS colleagues to try and promote this. Um, experience tells us from all the screening and immunisation programmes we have in England that it's much better to persuade people to take up the offer than to force them. So we'll continue to do that. I think from the information I've seen, they're talking about bringing this in in October, aren't they, with a 16 week lead in period. So we can and we've done some surveys to try and understand well, why aren't why aren't you coming forward to your vaccination? We try to make it as easy as possible for people to come forward. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people that haven't come forward are still really worried about fertility. And they are of an age group where that is particularly important to them. So we're doing some more work to try and make sure they've got all the information they need to make an informed decision. Um, and some people are just against vaccination. There's a very small proportion of the population that just genuinely don't believe in it. Um, so, again, we, we try to give the, them the information they need to, to make an informed decision about um, about the vaccination. I think whenever I've done any communications about this, I've just tried to encourage people to go to reputable sources to find out about the vaccination you know, don't go to facebook um if you know there's lots of information on our website on the ccg's website um to try and give you the right information so they can make an informed choice i think that's that's great and i think siobhan are you there are you back no no okay <laughs> never mind but thank you sarah that was great terry is that does that answer your question and you're on mute at the moment i know thank you thank you sarah okay yeah. Yeah. Oh dear. Pam, I think you need to mute. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, Sarah, lovely talking to you. Good to see you. Um, the nine 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 services. How have they all been vaccinated, or what's the what's the proceeds for the nine nine services? Thank you. I, th I think the short answer is, Pam, that I'm I'm not fully briefed on that because that's the, the vaccination programme is being led by the um, NHS. So NHS staff in the very early days, health and social care staff were one of the first groups to be offered the vaccination. So ambulance staff would have been included in that. Absolutely. Um, as would any, any staff, staff in primary care and GP practices um, in the community hospitals and in the acute. So I don't have any data to hand. I've not heard there's a particular issue with uptake anywhere across the health service. Um, but we can certainly ask the question for you of CCG colleagues. Could I ask members to reserve their COVID-19 questions until we come to Siobhan's bit on the agenda and she'll be fully able to um, answer um, your questions. We're still with Sarah on public health. 
And are there any more public health questions? Yeah, we've got we've got Lisa. Lisa, did you want to ask a question? Lisa there, yes. Y yes, I did. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm interested, um, Sarah, in, um, I know that you said it in a few times you're in your report about whole system um, analysis and overview, um, something which I think is really, really important and fundamentally lacking in local government um, generally, because I think it's very, very difficult. We, we deal with the problems of today to day without perhaps being able to think about the you know, things coming down the line. And I just wondered how you um how you how you do that and how you can manage that. Um I know certainly from my experience and the uh, you know as a housing cabinet member that you know so many issues come from poor housing. But we, we you know we house people the, in the way that we can today, but perhaps that's not the best for them in two years, five years, ten years. Um and I just wondered about how you coordinate all of that in, in order to be able to <clears throat> um, you know, get the best health outcomes, which obviously are over a very long period of time, one would hope, um, whilst also, you know, tallying up the budget, I guess. I think, I think the issue is that it could be absolutely huge, couldn't it? And um, we, when I took over as Director of Public Health in 2015, we were a very small team. So I think, I think public health is everyone's business. Um, I think district councils are working incredibly hard. I would I would label what they do as as tackling the wider determinants of health, housing, you know, environment, leisure, the environmental health work, economy. Um, they might not call it that, but I think they're doing public health work. So part of my job as the director of public health is to make those links and to make, you know, I spend a lot of my time building relationships with people. So I know I could ring up any of the chief execs in the districts, you know, the senior police officers senior people in the nhs because we've built those relationships and my team have built the relationships so it's not necessarily about us doing everything we don't even even i don't even attempt to try and understand everything that's going on at the moment because as a county because of our, our borders are all coterminous i think we're really fortunate that we have um, a really good footprint to work within so that that really helped us with covid as i said because we'd had those relationships so i think some of it is around having an overarching strategy that everyone can look at and think, oh, OK, I see where I fit in that. And that's what we've tried to do with this latest iteration of the health and wellbeing strategy with this golden thread of tackling inequalities. And I think that the seven priorities in, in the strategy, one of them is around housing and it's around where the health and wellbeing strategy can add on the board, can add value, because the districts do a good job of, of working through the housing issues. We've got a good partnership around that. But where is it that that strategic health and wellbeing board can actually add value to that housing discussion? There's no point replicating the work that's already going on. Um, and I think the, the discussions we've had to date around tackling inequalities, and I've just been in a discussion with my cabinet members, Cathy and Carol, about this. You know, we've been trying to tackle inequalities for over 40 years. We've had limited impact. And the evidence suggests that we need that whole system approach where we work together and we really listen to what communities want and feel they need. Um, and that's a very different way of working. And it, it's, it involves rather us all doing our little bit, but actually linking together more coherently. So it is very difficult. I completely recognise the point you're making. Um, I also think it's about how we as professionals and elected members feel about our positions, because if we're really going to listen to communities, it's about giving them some of the power for deciding what happens. And I think that can sometimes be quite difficult. And I can say that as someone you know, I trained in environmental health, I've trained in public health, I've got double dose of professional training. And it's quite difficult then to think, well, actually, um, I'm going to sit on my hands here and listen to what the community is saying. I'm, I'm very open about how I've been on my journey with that, because I think it's the right thing to do. And I think it's it's difficult for some of us because we're used to being in charge and being in control and knowing what the answer is. People look to me all the time for the answer. And sometimes I think the answers are in the communities themselves and we perhaps need a little bit of a leap of faith to go with some of those those answers, particularly at a local level, what would work in communities, for example. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Yes, sharing. I've always thought, um, I've probably started off my public health journey by thinking that public health was a standalone subject no way it is a it is a ginormous jigsaw <laughs> of problems and opportunities that you solve one and another one pops up out of the out of, out of the subject matter so you really never stop being surprised with public health and the public's perception of public health it's quite a complex subject thank you are we no more questions 
So, Sarah, so, uh, Trent, uh, did you want to ask another question, Pam? Yes, uh, I don't know what Sarah's saying with this meeting, Chair, but uh, this is, oh, you are. Actually, I'm going to ask a question now. Uh, it's with the new house centre on the Keys. Uh, I've had residents asking, you know, and people, uh, they thought it's going to be open at the end of this month, and I said, no way. And also, they've asked, how do they apply to go there? And I said, well, I thought your doctors would refer you. So have you any idea when the centre will be open, please, Sarah, and what the residents got to do? I'm really sorry, Pam. I've not been involved at all in that. Um, we can certainly try and get an answer from the CCG for you. If, if Joe's noted the question, we can we can get an answer for you for that. Oh, thank sorry, you. I've, I've not been involved at all in that in that development. Sorry. No, I, I'll I'll, I'll, um, I'll take that one away then, Pam. That's that's good. Thank you. Could, could I just? I'm oh, sorry. Go on. Could I just ask the committee a question? I think that because we've, as, as as Joe said, we've we've got a very short turnaround for papers for the next committee, and we've drafted some of, um, in areas that we think people would be interested in. Um, but if there's anything you particularly, you, that perhaps you've looked at in the report and thought well, I'd be really interested in something a bit more about that, or that could make a really good scrutiny item, then you know, please please do come back to us because we want to make sure that we bring you reports and scrutiny items that are of, of value. Um, and um, we, we've obviously brought lots of things to, to scrutiny in the past, but things do change, um, services evolve, so um, any feedback would be really welcome. Thank you. Yes. Can we proceed now, members? Everybody happy so far? No Thank more you. questions on, on that report. We can Thank now move on to the next item. Your part two now, adults social care report. Thank you. Just get off mute. So um, this is the other half of my job, but not even a half. It's, it's a much bigger proportion of my job now, I think. So adult social care, another really huge, complex area, I would suggest. Um, um, I think one of my reflections would be, having been in the job now six months, is that public health has got lots of areas and sometimes they connect together and sometimes they don't. Adult social care, I think, is a very complex web of services. Um, and um, functions. So um, we support around 25,000 people that are vulnerable or have a disability or live with an age-related disorder. Um, and we are you know, by far the biggest um, budgetary area of the council. We employ, I think, around 1,300 staff in adult social care. Now, it varies a little bit, obviously, but um, it, it easily over 1,300 staff. And our, our revenue budget is £155 million a year. Um, so the paper talks through some of the key areas in adult social care, but does take you through some of the, the, the main piece of legislation that guides what we do. The Care Act was marked a significant change in direction in terms of how adult social care was managed. Um, and it um, consolidated and modernised the, the legislative framework that underpinned care. So it talks there through some of those key issues and some of them. And you can begin to see why being director of public health and director of adult social services mesh together, because it's it's built on a principle of well-being. Um, and that that really is is very clear through quite a lot of the work that we do in terms of how we try in, in, in support and enable people's well-being through our services. Um, and it's it, it has really changed how we provide adult social care. And so the service has been through quite a, a, a significant change over the last few years. So we're required to um, work in partnership with our, our partners in health and housing and welfare. So that means, again, working really close to the districts and the NHS. And, and what's asked of us as, as adult social care is that we take steps to prevent, reduce and delay the need for care. And you'll see further on in the report that um, our approach to three tier conversations. Um, I think the other thing it does is it, it places a, a, a duty on us to provide information and advice on care and support. And we have a, a fabulous resource called Your Circle. It's a website. If you haven't seen it, I think you probably find it really helpful for all the queries in your post bags um, because we, we keep it up to date. Basically, it's a whole uh, catalogue of um, services and groups and things that are uh, based in the community to, to help people and support people stay independent and engaged and to prevent loneliness and isolation. So that's called Your Circle. And we can put the um, the website address in the notes, Joe, just so everyone's got it. Um, and I think one of the other key um, requirements of the, of the Care Act was our role in terms of ensuring diversity and quality in the market. So um, we buy adult social care from a whole range of different providers on behalf of a group of, of the population. Now, we tend to other people, if, you, if you're a self-funder, you go and buy your own health care. So you can, you can buy your own nursing home place or residential care home place or your own domiciliary care 
or um, some personal support to come into your home. But we buy that for, for quite a large number of individuals, um, around 25,000 in the county. And so we have a role in, in managing that market to make sure that we've not only got the type of service we want to buy, but also that that market is stable. So you might you might have seen on the news that sometimes we see care providers that um, that, that go out of business. We're then we're then um, required then to support those individuals. For example, if a care home went out of business, we would then have to support the individuals in the care home, find them somewhere else to live, move them, settle them, just make sure they were, that that process was well managed. So clearly, we don't want businesses going out of, of of business, do we? We want we want to have a market that's vibrant, but we need to make sure it's providing the care that we need. And as you'll see further on, um, we've seen a move away from institutional care towards promoting independence and enabling people to live in their own homes. Um, so the other part of the Care Act talks about um, adult safeguarding. And there's a further mention of adult safeguarding further on in the agenda. That's another really important part of what we do. We've got statutory duties around how we safeguard adults. So on page two, figure one, there's our vision for adult social care and Gloucestershire helping you to help yourselves and really that promotion of independence and well-being so we want a resilient population that aspires to live independent lives because I think everything people told us was that actually they don't necessarily want to go into a care home people much prefer living in their own home and want some support to do that we want um, people living in more inclusive and supportive communities so we've done a lot of work around um, supporting the voluntary and community sector um, um, and we've established these things called Know Your Patch Networks in each of the six districts, so to enable the local professionals working on the ground to link people into these, these initiatives that are going on. We want people to be able to access good quality care and support where needed, and we want to reduce dependence on social care. So we know that going forward, there were some changes in, in the demography of, of our county. We know we'll see, uh, we're seeing an ageing population across the country, but also we know that um, the work that was done for it a few years ago for our Vision 2050 strategy showed that in a few years time, the number of working age adults will reduce and reduce and reduce. So we, we're effectively losing, um, we've got a reducing pool of people to draw upon to employ to help support our ageing population. So we needed to find a better way to manage and respond to the demand for adult social care services. And so we, we created something called the Adult Single Programme and this adult, this adult Social Care Vision. And we wanted to try and develop a new relationship with communities and individuals themselves and it wasn't just about going in and assessing people it's about understanding well what can you do for yourself what would you like to do would you like to stay at home and um, actually what support is there in your family in your community to help you to do that and then what support do you need from us to, to do what to do that and it's about what the individual wants rather than necessarily doing an assessment and putting someone in a care home so we've got a reducing reliance on institutional care um, and that then the, the flip side of that is then we, we've got a growing demand for what we call domiciliary care and helping people to, to live in their own homes independently. On page three, you'll see figure two, the adult social care offer, um, um, sort of that, that semicircle diagram. And it talks about three tiers and we and, and very much the first tier is, is helping you to help yourself. Um, and so the first step isn't necessarily stepping in to give you something. It's about what I was talking about before, listening to people, really understanding what they want and how we can help them achieve it. And then, you know, if, if we can't help you to help yourself, then actually we try and give you the help you need it when you need it to that top tier ongoing support for those who really need it, who are quite frail. So the next part of the report talks about the different um, teams within adult social care and they are discrete teams but they work really closely together because as I said the adult social care is a complex web of services so we, we've got an operational team um, and this is where the bulk of the staff sit so we've got six locality teams one for each district council area we've got um, an acute hospital team that manages um, people help manage people to come out of hospital and we've got a learning disability team um, and then the learning disability team supports um, younger adults through to through to older adults and we've also got a sensory team as well so they're out and about in our districts now. We also have a commissioning team and we share this team with the local clinical commissioning group. And we've got a really highly developed integrated commissioning function. And this is, I think, something to be celebrated and to be proud of. Um, quite often other areas come to talk to us about how we've managed to achieve this. So we've got a director of integrated commissioning that reports to me and to the accountable officer of the CCG. And she manages um, a team and a budget and commission services on behalf of both the clinical commissioning group and the county council. And examples of those services are things like the integrated brokerage team. And this, the brokerage team buy packages of care for people to enable them to live independently in their own homes or to get them out of hospital. 
um, <clears throat> and also it's the in, it's the commissioning team that um, fulfilled the function of market management and market shaping and that's around understanding and that some of the needs and analy analyzing the needs in terms of the health and social care market and then working with those um, statutory private and voluntary sectors to ensure that we've got a good range of services to meet those needs <clears throat> and then we have safeguarding and we have a safeguarding team and there's a brief discussion in this paper around the safeguarding duties that we have as a local authority. We have a, a safeguarding board um, chaired by, it has an independent chair called Paul Yateman. Um, and we meet, I think it's every two, two months. And we have a strategy and um, there are three core duties under the CARE Act that the Adult Safeguarding Board must, must meet. And under that, we carry out safeguarding adult reviews. So where there has been a, an incident um, <clears throat> when an adult has needed care and support in an area and, and then they die either of, of, as a result of abuse or neglect or whether um, there are concerns that perhaps part, one of the partners agencies could have done more to protect that individual then we'll do a review and we've had some really good learning that's come out of these reviews and we've changed policy and practice as a result. And then finally, the adult single programme, which is almost like the, the um, strategy and um, transformation part of adult social care that to, and, and that's um, how we try and if you like stay ahead we've got you know, a huge operational element to our work we, we buy a lot of services for people but how do we understand what's best practice what do we need to do to um, best meet the needs the current needs and the future needs of our population so that strategy and transformation team are called the adult single program and there's our contacts at the end so i'll pause there to see if there are any questions Thank you. Um, are there any questions? I, I see no raised hands. Oh, Mark, Mark, would you like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one occasionally reads in the press horrifying stories of um, elderly and vulnerable people leaving uh, hospital and sort of virtually being dumped on a doorstep. To what extent um, are you able to become involved in that transition period and to protect and, and completely avoid those sorts of horrific stories? So it very much depends on, um, on the individual. So a lot of people are discharged from hospital and are picked up by a family member or feel perfectly able to go home and um, just convalesce and recuperate at home. Um, and that's probably easily half the people that come out of hospital. But we need to recognise that some people are older and more vulnerable and need a bit more help. So sometimes people come out of hospital and they go into what we call a, um, an assessment bed. So they, they don't actually go home. They go they go to a bed and we, we do some work with them in terms of the therapists that we jointly employ with the NHS. And we do an adult social care assessment on see what, what support do they need before they can go home. Um, and there are some people that leave hospital, a very small proportion go straight into, into residential or nursing care. But those that go home that perhaps are a little bit more vulnerable, perhaps you know, these ones put the heating on, is there food in the fridge? Do they feel fully capable of going home? Then I think that that need is identified in the hospital and there are services that can go in and support them. Um, Age UK provides something very similar. Um, and I've not heard of a particular problem in Gloucestershire. It, with the number of people passing through our, our acute hospital then it is likely that perhaps we have had this situation but we have got services that um, can go in and, and support someone when they are home from hospital even that putting on the heating and the lighting if you've been on hospital for a, a week and it's winter and it's cold and it's dark I mean that we don't tend to discharge people at night but you know even at four o'clock in the afternoon in December it can be pretty miserable have they got a pint of milk and some and something to eat that night you know do they know when the district nurse is coming the next day those sorts of things there is a service that can help assist with that but that need needs to be identified in the hospital before they're discharged. Thank you. Um, Suzanne, Suzanne Williams, did you want to ask a question? Uh, sorry, I, I sort of kind of changed my mind because it really was answered. But okay. um, uh, sorry, I was going to say over the years I have been a county councillor, I've come across a few situations where somebody is very obviously not capable of looking after themselves and it's very difficult to um, get any, any engagement or know what is being engaged, what, ha what is happening for them. Um, two of the cases were people that had in, inherited, um, but their parent they were they were people with learning difficulties, and they had inherited from their parents and had nobody there to actually really look after them. 
And um, there was one gentleman who actually had no working bathroom and the contents of whatever used to come, used to be put into the local litter bin, which was a little bit scary for people right by the children's play area. Didn't like that idea. Um, and there's another one that was causing issues for his neighbours that, and I, I know officially they were adults, but somehow or other they slipped through the system between being a child needing care and an adult needing care. Um, are there many people in that situation? Thank you. I think it's difficult to say, isn't it? Because I don't know about the people we don't know about. Um, I think what I would say is that we've got an adult social care help desk. Um, so if, if if you come across people who you think are vulnerable, then um, I get emails all the time from elected members who are concerned about things. People approach Cathy and Carol as the cabinet members. We're always really happy to receive a query or, you know, can you help me with this person? Um, and we'll look into it. And sometimes it, it, it's determined whether if that person has is deemed to be um, has capacity under the Mental Capacity Act, then sometimes we, we can't help them. Um, sometimes we're already aware of them and we're working with them. Not everybody welcomes input from adult social care. Um, we need to be mindful of that. But um, I, I, it's difficult to answer your question, Suzanne, but you know, I just, I'm, we're always really happy to hear if you think if you're worried about someone because we can we can take a look at it and see if we're able to help. Thank you, thank you Sarah. May I ask the question? Um, I think just uh, Councillor Steve Robinson first, Pam, and then I'll bring you in. Uh, okay, thank you. Steve? Oh, You're muted, Steve, I think. Could you unmute? Thank you. We get re used to this by now. Um, thank you. Uh, a couple of years ago, when um, the two care homes were closed in Stroud for one reason or another, fit for purpose or yeah, yes or whatever, um, you, I know that at that time there were plenty of places, and um, I remember Margaret saying that uh, you know we're paying for so many places, um, and uh, they're not always taken up, and you have to, you know, we have to pay these organisations for so many places. With COVID, et cetera, are, is the county actually, do we know how many places we're paying for that are not taken up? And is that is that quite a few still? So, so this falls within the sort of market management statutory role that we have. So I know at any one time, certainly since COVID, we've got around a thousand empty beds care home beds across nursing and residential in the county um, I'm not saying we pay for all of those we have a, a special contractual relationship with a with a group of care homes where we we do pay um, a minimum amount to them and sometimes that does mean paying for empty beds but I've not got an up-to-date number um, with me today Steve but I think at the moment well, that's one of the things we're doing at the moment is looking if, with those thousand empty beds how do we best manage the market and and is there the likelihood of people going into those beds in the short term probably not because that would be a huge change wouldn't it in terms of how we use um, residential nursing care um, but I think it, I would describe the market management statutory function as a, as a constant juggling act to try and make sure we've got enough for example, domiciliary care and um, bed-based care in nursing and, and residential beds. I think it might be something that you might want to have a scrutiny item on um, at a later date, perhaps maybe in September. I think the turnaround for papers is quite short, isn't it? It's, it's Monday morning or Friday afternoon, isn't it, Joe? But certainly something we could bring something back yeah. to you. And I know that Margaret um, in October brought a paper, didn't she, around market management to the mm. to the the old committee, which I know some of you were not on, but there is a helpful update in October's papers, which I'm, we could always share if useful. I, I can share that and I can, I'll can make a note to perhaps think of this as something that we could look at at the September um, committee meeting. Good, yeah. So I've made a note of that. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, so that will be added to the work programme. So, so at that time, would we be considering um, any more closures because of, of, of you know, being over undersubscribed. Uh, I think it's something we're definitely reviewing, um, and we've got an estate strategy. So perhaps we could come and give an update on that um, in in September uh, at September scrutiny, um, and then we can mm -hmm. perhaps give a bit more detail. I've not got all the facts and figures to hand, Steve, so I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> only only for it to to be wrong. So um, perhaps we could bring a, a fuller paper and, and it would be a scrutiny item. Kathy and Carol, are you happy with that? Um, and we can then give you a more in-depth um, 
yeah. briefing on it because I think that it's 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 one it's one one it all yeah. statutory duties in the Care Act are important, obviously, but this is one that we're looking at at the moment because of the impact of COVID and, and people you know, moving away from that institutional care, mm. wanting to stay in their own homes. So it is it's something that's um, particularly relevant at the moment. And of course, Steve, it's a balancing that really. If you think about the purpose of our adult social care offer, is to keep people in their own homes. Oh yes, yeah. A consequence of that is there are more vacancies in care homes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's it really is a, a balancing act. Yeah. Yeah. I I quite understand that having a having a mother-in-law who's one hundred and one and still living in her own home. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pam and then Mark. Pam, do you want to ask a question? Actually, um, some of the questions have been answered, but I think you could have, uh, that's a really good one, uh, you know, with the vacancies, etc. But what about a little task group on that one? But anyway, Sarah, just uh, just something else here is um, the continuity of, um, if it's uh, carers going into people who go in their homes and, and they have about three different carers a day, uh, you know, there's not an even balance and they can't seem to get use and bond with the carers what goes in. But we've got no control on that. And some carers go in and they can't speak the language. OK, so this is domiciliary care, isn't it? When people go into their homes to help them with um, sort of um, dress washing, dressing and, and, and eating, isn't it? Only some um, sort of an hour, they're saying, you know, they go in and go out and then, you know, for I don't know. Could we have any secret shoppers on this or whatever? Well, would would you like to, a piece on domiciliary care and how we how we yeah. try and assure quality as as a potential agenda item on the on the forward plan? Yeah. What do you think, Chair? Yes, most certainly, because we have to understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah. a lot of these care of uh, these agencies are just sending, and they're not having the training. And so, train, they go into these dear people. And, and they're in and out. We'll introduce it in a future agenda, Pam. Thank you so much. I'm making a note of these um, Thank you, members and Sarah. Thank you, Pam. Um, Mark, did you want to ask another question? Yes, it, it's all related. Um, I'm aware locally where we are that um, the dementia care home in Borton, for example, which was... Uh, a wonderful new, um, newly built about three or four years ago. Um, they had real issues over staffing, and uh, I think that this is a problem across the county. And it's all very well having the availability of the the beds, um, but you know if you can't find the the, the, the properly trained staff, we're in a bit of a difficult position. And it, this must be exactly the same with the um, the staff who go into uh, people's homes as well. And I just wonder whether that could be part of the paper that uh, might come up. I, I think that's a really good suggestion. We know that um, staffing in, in care in the care sector is an, is an issue. I think we saw some issues around parity with NHS staff through the pandemic. Um, there are there are issues around pay training um and seeing caring as a profession so i i would suggest this is probably its own agenda item um yeah, on, on a future agenda plan because it is really important you're absolutely right mark there is a problem with recruitment and retention um we also have uh, a number of um initiatives ongoing at the moment in terms of how we recruit and, and retain people in in the care sector so we do that on behalf of the care sector so we, we could bring a paper on that as well I think Joe's made a note of that also. Lots of notes, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more raised hands. No. Um, Can we just I... ask, ask Carol and Cathy whether they want to say anything before we move away from adult social care? Because they're very, two important, very important players in this. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. That's Carol. Um, I, I'd just like to reassure members that we, we've got several issues that Kath and I are reviewing with the director and with all our staff and the committee have picked up very insightfully on some of the key ones so um, we, we seem in tune with that that we share a common understanding and a worry or concern about what's coming down the line and how we're going to manage it and as you rightly say chairman it, it's about a balance 
trying to make sure that we meet as many needs as we can appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy? No, I just echo what Carol says, really. So she's, she summed that up very well. Thank you. So without any more ado, are you happy, Sarah, that we've answered all the questions properly? And we can now move on. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Who's now a professor, by the way? She wasn't <laughs> a professor at the end of the last session, and she, here she emerges with a professorship. Goodness me. Congratulations, seriously. Congratulations. Can we now go on to the Community Safety Report with Mark Priest? who is our newly appointed Chief Fire Officer. Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Nice, and, uh, nice Kansas, to see you. Thank you. Um, the report starts on page 31 of your papers. It's agenda item 3C. And in a similar vein to Sarah, um, I appreciate you've read the papers before the meeting, so I'll pick up the salient points as I make my way through the paper. Um, as Joe explained at the start of the discussion, um, Due to a decision that was made at the annual general meeting back in May um, and the establishment of a new fire scrutiny committee panel, which is being chaired by Councillor Jeremy Hilton, um, the element of fire won't be included in this update. And you can see the terms of reference points A to H on page 31 that covers the, uh, the areas that that scrutiny panel will review when they meet in future. Turning to the areas where I do have a responsibility to report to yourself in regards to trading standards, uh, uh, you'll see from the paper that uh, demand over 2021 has increased due to the additional work that's occurred due to COVID. Conversely, the number of inspections we've carried out has reduced because of the, the COVID restrictions. But what we are starting to see now as we make our way through the roadmap of recovery due to COVID is that trading standards are starting to return to normal functions and starting to uh, carry out their normal role and visits. Turning over to page 32. Um, our officers are once again responding to a variety of consumer complaints um, that pose an imminent threat around food outlets, farms and livestock and markets. And we're also starting to look at traders' compliance following the change um, resulting from the EU exit. And that's starting to take up some of their working capacity. Um, we also, on behalf of the Food Standards Agency, monitor levels of um, intervention with high, medium and low risk food premises. There has been a backlog because of COVID, but we're now starting to address that and we're confident we'll be able to bring that back online during the course of the next year. So that's in regards to the trading standards. Um, moving to coroners. Um, during COVID, our coroner services continue to function as normal. There have been some changes in terms of um, guidance from the senior coroner in regarding to uh, examinations and about um, the invasiveness of the examinations we would normally do points of death and those have been eased which has reduced some of the workload and what the coroner's team have done at Barnwood is they've operated in two separate bubbles to make sure they were COVID compliant as we've um, now seen that all of our um, mortuary technicians and coronary staff have had their, their jabs picking up the earlier question by one of the councillors regarding the vaccinations that has now been eased and their team is starting to work as normal. We're also now beginning to pick up the inquests that have been delayed during the uh, COVID restrictions, and we'll try and address those during the course of the next year and again get ourselves back online with the in um, inquest that we would need to have completed. And as we move forward, the coroners will also start to investigate the, the way that we can potentially use non-invasive means or electronic means to conduct um, um, inquests and also facilitate virtual hearings. Uh, turning to the, my final area of responsibility, which is the civil protection team, which support the local resilience forum. Um, the team continue to support the response to COVID-19. Um, we've now been able to staff the team on the basis that they can provide 24-7 resilience throughout the entire year. There's been additional members of staff over the last 12 months. Previously, it was just two members of staff. We've now got um, uh, four and potentially four recruit to six. And during the previous 12 months, we've dealt with several incidents of note that I'll just you know, raise for your interest. We've had an explosion of property requiring a potential evacuation. We've dealt with suspect packages. We've had a water supply interruption. We've had an unexploded device and we've had a significant building fire. Uh, and all of those have had an impact on the CPT team who facilitated um, evacuation and temporary rest facilities 
for the affected residents. As you see on page 33, there are a number of plans that we're statutorily required to produce, and those plans are being produced covering mass evacuation and shelter plans, animal disease, multi entity flood plans, and major incident hazard pipeline plans, just to mention a couple. And as we go forward, we'll start to address um, training and do multi agency exercises, which is a key part of the civil protection's role. Um, you may be aware as well that the civil protection team have service level agreements with five of the districts. Um, we provide that facility on behalf of those districts for the out of office hours cover. And we also play a role within the prevent agenda and sit on the partnership boards. So uh, I'll pause there and if there's any, come back to you with an answer if I, if I don't know at the time. Thank you. You're muted, Stephen. A bit of background noise. Any questions, members? I've got no raised hands at the moment. No. no. So, if you wish, Mark, you can press on. Thank you, everyone. Well, that's thank my very much, Mark. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, before we go any further, I'm just going to um, uh, now uh, raise a, present a, a slide, um, Chairman. Um, for Cam for Colin Chick, uh, Colin, welcome to the meeting. I did. I just wanted to say at the start of the meeting, Colin, I did explain to the committee the overlap, slight overlap, with some of the other committees that this committee has, including particularly in your areas, the environment scrutiny, and that from time to time, I will share papers from environment scrutiny with this committee to pick on key points and and issues. So I did sort of um, highlight that fact that there is. A little bit of overlap there. Um, Chairman, are you happy for me to just um, put the slideshow up for Colin? I'm ecstatic, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Ecstatic, yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> It's like my IT's been this morning. I didn't get in until quarter past ten because I just couldn't get into the meeting, first of all. I think you should see the uh, the slideshow now. Can you see it on your screens, members? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, okay, um, if you can move on to the, the third. Obviously, this is about economy, environment and infrastructure. But... Um, there's two areas in particular that I'm going to draw out later that um, within ENI that really probably is more focused towards this particular scrutiny committee and the work that you do. Um, but I thought it was really important to have an understanding of how that fits into ENI um, as a department, because um, in much the same way in what Sarah said this morning, um, e and I is at the front line of almost everything you do. We could answer with we, we answer the economy scrutiny committee, environment scrutiny committee, but also this this committee as well. And when you look at what we do, you suddenly understand why. Because you know, the single biggest determinant um, of health is wealth. So, what do we say? We are economy. The second biggest determinant of health is environment. The environment you live in, the way you go about in the world. And again, that's environment. You know, that's exactly what the other part of of, of um, ENI is: economy, environment, and of course, then there's the infrastructure, which is the important aspect to support the way we live and we move around. And we should never forget, again, back to health, that you know, the biggest advances in saving lives is not medical; it's actually engineering; it's actually infrastructure. Um, you know, the amount of lives that have been saved through public health engineering and municipal engineering um, just completely, completely overwhelm anything that's ever been done in the health sector by itself. So, you know, and we forget about that because we just take it for granted now, you know, the eradication of cholera and all the rest of it and things like that was public health engineering. So when you look at it in that way, you suddenly realise why, in actual fact, we could almost report to any security, uh, scrutiny committee because... Um, you know, if you, if you look at what it is you're doing, what we're doing, you're looking at economy um, and environment. But the end result of those two put together is actually health. So if you can look at the whole picture, you suddenly see what the power is of the department. Um, so I thought it's important to reflect on on all the different areas we cover. Um, and just very quickly, we're running through um, 
you generally won't see these people, but Kath Harv looks after highways. Um, Simon Excel looks after strategic infrastructure, all new infrastructure and planning and um, flooding and um, uh, heritage and things like that. Um, and economic development, I shouldn't forget. Uh, there's community infrastructure, which um, we're gonna, I'll talk about in a bit more detail, so I won't labour that point now. There's um, libraries and registration with Jane. Um, again, a quite an important part of this particular um, scrutiny committee's function. There's adult education, which you know answers substantially to economy, but equally um, has a very important part to play. You think about um, adult education's role at the moment with economic recovery. There's you know, you know at the moment there's something like seventeen and a half thousand people unemployed, the highest for ten years in Gloucestershire. Um, but in September. Um, furlough will come to an end. At the moment, there's about 30, there's about 36, 37,000 people furloughed, twice as many people as those unemployed at the moment. A lot of those won't have jobs. A lot of those will not have the skills to get back into employment. Um, and the role of adult education in making sure that those people who probably traditionally worked in the hospitality sector and other sectors where they had low skill base, they want jobs. They're going to have to upgrade and get, you know, at least maths and English in levels one and two. And you can already see it. We're running courses that are full at the moment, um, remotely and and in person to um, uh, adults um, to get them up to levels one and two in maths and English. And in fact, the the demand is so great for the first time ever. We are we have been negotiating with our uh, our tutors to run summer schools right through the summer because we see how important that's going to be, particularly you know for youngsters coming out of school. Um, 16, 17, 18 year olds who traditionally, if they have low qualifications, low aspiration levels, they tend to go into the hospitality sector and then they gradually progress from there. Um, those jobs, those immediate uh, low skill jobs aren't available at the moment. So therefore it becomes really important to make sure that we can give them the access to, you know, to, to give them levels one and two so they can get onto apprenticeships and things like that. So the other thing we're doing at the moment is setting up an, em an employment skills group deliberately um, to aim towards um, uh, disabled, disadvantaged, young, uh, young ad adults and mid-career adults and everyone that um, will act as a centre for um, pointing people in the right direction to um, gain the necessary skills, where there's job opportunities, where they can get skilled up to access those jobs. Um, and it's a complete wayfinder service that will be based initially in Gloucester um, in a hub but we'll, in fact, um, uh, we'll be looking to do outreach groups within the libraries so that we can take those sorts of opportunities out to the communities, particularly those that are um, in, in more rural, isolated communities and things like that. And then obviously waste management. You know, let's, not, you know, let's not forget waste management. We, we overlook it. You know, the removal of clinical waste every day comes back to our own waste management. When we're keeping people in their homes, that clinical waste that... that, that that um, needs to be removed comes down to comes down to us to remove safely. You put it into perspective. Every year, um, we move the equivalent of three hundred thousand Ford Fiestas, about two hundred ninety-five thousand tons of waste are removed every year from the county. But you know, it, you know, even that we try to turn to a positive. Fifty thousand tons of garden waste becomes composted and reused back. Twenty-five thousand tons of food waste is used to produce biomethane, um, enough to power 500, uh, 5,000 homes. And of course, our other waste goes to incineration or uh, energy from waste um, plant, which is enough to power 25,000 houses with electricity. So you start to see how whole picture starts to connect up in terms of what we're doing across the board. Um, and as you can see there, our, our range of partners we need are, are, are phenomenal from you know, making sure that we, we make the most remote people can access really important at the moment with COVID, you know, um, that ability to be able to connect with ordering food and, and booking your medical appointment becomes really important if you're at home um, and can't get out. Um, if you can get out, obviously, those the, the ability to move people um, with our bus operators and special provisions we make through our contractors becomes really important. And of course, all the other um, uh, partners you can see there, which are mostly from an economic, uh, transport and environment perspective. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. 
Um, so our responsibilities, well, it, it really falls down to three areas. Emergency and responsive. Um, despite the claims of the AA that they are the fourth emergency service, I would argue we are in Gloucestershire. Um, and I can prove that because the week before Christmas, we had the flood in, the, the, the heavy rain that caused the surface water flood in. That went into a freezing period of freezing. And then that went into snow. And the snow was washed away by another round of flooding and heavy rain. And then that was followed by another freeze and then again um, uh, snow. And what that meant was was my frontline staff were actually um, out on call from the week before Christmas into the last week in February. It was basically nine to ten weeks of constant um, out on frontline protecting the community. Um, and then when they weren't doing that, they were actually repairing the damage to the roads at the rate of 1,000 potholes a week. We repaired 16,000 potholes between um, the 1st of January to the 30th of April. And again, you know, they're the sorts of things that people can trip up, can ha have those accidents, those life-changing um, accidents, which become really, really important um, in re making sure we keep on top of those repairs. And then, of course, there's our core services. You just, I just ran you through there, the, the six core areas of our service. And then there is a transformation and growth about looking forward about the economic recovery of the county, about providing housing for the future in the most sustainable way, not just wrapping another sort of onion ring around the town and moving people further out so they're even more isolated, but how we actually how we create the growth in the future that is in the most sustainable way and meets the needs of the county whilst protecting all those things that make the county so great in terms of its environment. Next slide, please, Joe. So, um, so these, are, as I mentioned, there's two key areas that report that will come that you'll see and probably and both Philip and Jane are on this on, on, on the call this morning and we'll I'll introduce you to them in a minute and they'll be the main probably points of contact. But here, community infrastructure, um, you know, as you can see here, deals with the integrated transport unit. Um, really important. You know, we move 6000 children a day to school um, through our various services. Um, and and then numerous elderly people get into day centres and that sort of thing, um, uh, and and obviously an, a, a, also concession work on the um, buses during the during the pandemic. We actually went further than that. We um, arranged for all of health workers to be able to get to work, even negotiating the train stations to make train companies to make sure the trains were running at the uh, shift times to make sure that even though the trains were massively reduced. The health workers get and we fronted all that up including the work with the um the bus companies to give free travel to the um to the uh, health workers and include the parking near the ho uh, near the free parking we put in as well or near the hospitals um sustainability and climate change um, as i mentioned um pete nathan drove delivers on the highways development management front so he deals with making sure the new developments are fit for purpose that um, that the the roads and the facilities that are provided, the footpaths, the cycle routes, the new developments that come along are done in the most sustainable way and meet future needs. Um, parking, Alex, um, Newport, and the traffic orders obviously something that's quite a, of quite a lot of concern and uh, to many people um, it has a big impact on in, and both the economy and on the environment. Um, Joe Atkins, we think travel and uh, the road safety data team. Um, really important on the road safety side um, in terms of um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the both the preventing of accidents and ensuring that the education, training and publicity programme is out amongst the community um, whilst making sure that we road safety audit all schemes going in to make sure that we try and engineer out any problems before, um, before they ever arise. And then the Gypsy and Travellers, which are obviously a very important area, that Lewis Broughton leads on. And it's all under Phil, uh, Philip Williams on community infrastructure. Um, next slide, please, Joe. And I already, already touched on this, but HDM enables growth, the ICU, public, community, education, transport, bus passes, thinking, think travel, i.e. most sustainable travel, getting people to walk more, the health the benefits and cycle. Um, we look after school crossing patrols, um, and the bike ability, and then the GCC fleet as well, which I just mentioned in terms of the ITU and, and moving people. Highway network management, um, road safety, um, you know, kill, uh, killed and seriously injured analysis, scheme prioritisation, cameras, 20 mile per hour zones, 
liaison with the police and GFRS, on street parking, street works, traffic signals, highway records. And it just last year alone, um, I, I did slide in a second, but we we um, managed and, and looked after um, and visited 750 different traffic signal sets to make sure they made, they were maintained and kept working properly. Um, obviously, highway records and modifications to the rights of way program, which has been really important recently. You've probably seen the way the rights of way and their public rights of way have been absolutely almost worn <laughs> destruction in places with so many people out and walking during COVID. Uh, climate change and air quality. Um, we produce the action plan to reduce CO2 emissions to net zero. We're just about to put in 1,000 electric vehicle charging points. We look after the whole renewable energy program. Um, tree planting and improving air quality um, and then the gypsy trails as I mentioned earlier uh, next slide please Joe <laughs> lives and registration uh, as you see here under Jane Jane's on the call as well this morning um, uh, her area is Jenny Jones operations manager Joe Larga um, registration risk service manager and then Curtis is development manager and Katie Smith is digital services manager. That digital service becomes really, really important because you'll see why in a second when I just run through these couple of areas that we will build on now. Joe, next slide, please. So on libraries, um, provide statutory library service at 39 uh, locations. That's almost a given. But it's what we're doing in those areas. We're rolling out innovation labs now, one per district. Those innovation labs give people a chance to gain real experience in, in IT. Um, we can teach five-year-olds how to code to get them thinking. We want to be a cyber county. There's not much point in being a cyber county if we're not bringing our youngsters through to train them towards those jobs we're creating. All we do is suck people in otherwise from elsewhere. So really important that. You know, in those innovation labs, you know, youngsters are seven or eight are taught how to build laptops and computers. We In those innovation labs, there's things like 3D printers, the latest 3D scanners, which not only allow people to gain the latest experience, but for um, uh, for small SMEs that want pro uh, want to produce products, um, they can go in there and use those facilities to uh, for for, for um, pro uh, uh, product um, formulation um, for the market and that sort of thing. And you know, in those libraries, they can also check up on. Um, we have a full um, uh, facilities where people can check up on. Um, uh, intellectual property rights and copywriting. So again, really supportive of, of those SMEs that want to look at um, product innovation, that sort of thing. Um, and um, also we have the full set of um, access to all the marketing um, and company information. So again, someone wanting to job with a company can go in and find out about the company or someone's looking to see about how their product can best fit onto the market. They can use libraries locally without having to come into Gloucester to do that. So, again, you see how we will, by the end of this year, um, have um, a, a, uh, a, an innovation lab in every district in the county. Um, uh, support groups of all ages. We also have free public Wi-Fi and PCs, ICT assistance, job clubs and career days, which, again, really important. And, you know, libraries are much, much more than libraries, you know, you know, that's yeah. the, on the practical side. There's also the culture side that libraries get involved with as well and bringing youngsters in at an early age. So right across and you know, right the way through the, the COVID, you know, we, we had to close the libraries, but we very quickly brought in click and collect um, for those people, you know, particularly elderly adult people in, in particular or homebound people that their books were really important to them and couldn't get to the library anymore. Um, and in fact, um, we very quickly set up an electronic ordering system where people could view the books and then actually have the books, order their books over line and have them online and then have them sent to them. So two different ways we found around the, uh, the, the difficulty of closing the libraries. Registration, you know, statutory registration, births and deaths and most of marriage, because you're performing legal marriage and civil partnerships, delivery and management of citizenship and the custody and care of historic records and the issue of copy certificates. This group took an absolute bashing during COVID um, you would never, you wouldn't believe it. And in fact, even now, they're still finding, you know, dealing with the aftermath of the decision last week um, to delay um, some of the um, release of the, the, the uh, um, of, from COVID because immediately people were straight onto them with their marriages, having had their de marriages delayed three or four times over the last year. And um, uh, it, it, it's been, you know, quite a, 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 a feat really getting through that, that period for them as a team. Um, 
and the, the government, for example, didn't um, didn't change the law around um, uh, birth certificate, birth birth. So we couldn't do it remotely. It still had to be done in person, which you couldn't do during COVID. So the massive um, backlog of births to register when we got to the other side of COVID. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. And just to give you a flavour out, oh, and uh, you probably gathered this by now from what I've been saying, but to give you an idea of our strategic service drivers and what we're trying to do, obviously implementing the COVID-19 economic recovery plan is really important over the next year to, year to three years, really, as we manage our way out of COVID and get people back into work. Ensure we meet the needs of adult learners. Again, that's connected with that first one, but right across the board. Extend the use of our libraries, those outreach posts into the community, which we can use for employment and skills um, and making those connections to um, the community we serve that are a bit more remote. Delivering a portfolio of major infrastructure projects. That is the long term, you know, Junction 10, Junction 9, about those, those major opportunities to deliver growth in the county in a most sustainable way. Improving the rail services, which have been something major we've been working on recently. And you already start to see some of those coming through the system. Um, in terms of next year, we'll have a 30 minute service to, to Bristol from Gloucester. We've got the hourly service now into London. Um, being responsive to how people connect and use their local communities is absolutely imperative at the front line of everything we do. Getting people to where they need to be, um, you know, whether that's health, whether it's wealth, whatever it may be, education. Um, particularly those people who may not have access to a car and rely on other means. Managing transition to being a carbon net zero authority by 2030, and that affects everyone from health right the way through. Engaging with our district partners to support the production of long-term growth plans. I mentioned that long-term vision for the county and how we take the county forward. And I think that does it for me. Thank you, Colin, very, very much. Thank you, Colin, very, very much indeed. It just shows how complex your responsibilities are and it affects the lives of almost everyone. Every Gloucestershire resident is affected by your activities. So thank you very much indeed. And thank, thank you. you to your team. And can just we... very quickly, Chair, um, Sorry. Um, there's obviously uh, Philip, do you want to give people away, Philip Williams, who is the... Uh, at lead commissioner head of um uh, community infrastructure Steve, hi and um and jane everest um who's head of libraries and registration so they're they're here with me today if um we need to field any need any field any questions in detail does anyone have any questions which um people would be very happy to answer councillor uh -huh. kate cody would like to ask a question chairman oh i'm gonna too. i'll come back to you pam all right sweetheart thank you Thank you. Um, just a quick question around libraries. Um, I was very fortunate as a child to have brilliant experiences with them, and I'm a massive fan and a big user of the library. And whilst I really welcome the sort of tech developments, um, it's just a question really around sort of imploring that we don't lose sight of the value of physical books. Um, but particularly for, for people who aren't necessarily computer literate, um, you know, the, the, just the choice and the way we order books. And I mean, I, I'd also like to give a massive shout out to the brilliance of the libraries during during COVID, actually. Um, we were able to stock up with as many books as we could get in the rucksack, basically. And they were a complete lifesaver during COVID. Um, and the flexibility, actually, of, of returning them, keeping them longer and all that sort of stuff. But... Um, from a book point of view, the value of education, the story time, all those sorts of things for children and giving them a sort of introduction to lifelong learning and the love of books. So it just slightly concerns me. I know we've got tech developments and all the rest of it, but um, the library used to be full of books and now it's sort of squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And uh, particularly thinking for people who aren't computer literate, who can't order books. And there's a very good service that you can order and it will come to your library. But that just sort of going in there and touching and feeling and browsing and choosing your books in, in that manner, um, particularly for, I guess, older people. But I don't want to put them in a box because um, I like physical books too. <laughs> um, so it's just a, a, a question around that, really. Shall I come back on that, Colin? 
That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kate, for, for pointing that out. Yeah, and, and I have to say, um, we do recognise the importance of physical stock. Um, whilst we know that e stock um, significantly, the use of e stock significantly jumped up over the COVID period, um, e stock is just a minor proportion of our, our physical stock issues. Um, and over the past year, um, we have actually invested additional money into the physical stock. Um, because of the fact that we had to quarantine stocks. So in order to maintain stock levels, there's been about 55,000 that's gone in over and above our normal stock budget. Um, so I am also a, a proponent of the physical book <laughs> as well and the importance of it. So, um, yeah, that, that is definitely a part of our, um, it's our USP going forward. Thank you, Jane. I think Councillor Pam Tracy, did you want to ask a question? Sometimes I've been thinking like it, it, the presentation, yeah, it's very, very good. And sometimes it's, it's trying to remember the numbers and getting old in the numbers sometimes too. Uh, but, you know, um, our biggest problem, I think, in the city is, uh, it, is slabs. Now, Lower Westgate Street, we have um, elderly people down there or more mature people. Um, we're forever, ever trying to get the payment slabs um, done. Now, sometimes workers need to be chat because they're pulling and the next week they're all out again. And I have so many complaints about the slabbing. And, and I, you know, and I think, you know, how do we get this done quicker? I mean, we, we had a good officer who come out on site. We had this one guy who keeps ringing up and emailing all the time. There's loads of broken slabs all around the city centre. And it's all right when we talk about it, but how? who checks who to see how the work is done? And, and I'm still waiting for slabs to be done from last year. Thank you. But I know it's not your problem. When have we have these pro uh, presentations, sometimes it's a job to get hold of officers and sometimes the work doesn't always get done how it's presented. It's not oh. just it's just an observation, like you know. Well, then I think you muted. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, the the honest truth is, is we you know we have not got the budget to keep our highways and footpaths um, to um, the highest possible standard that probably people would like to have and expect. Um, we use a. Um, we we use a national um, uh, prioritisation, um, and um, on 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 maintenance. So if if as soon as a, you know, busy areas are inspected every week, um, if a, a um, this is assuming that no, someone doesn't report it so, themselves, um, but unfortunately, um, what what under that standard, what you would regard as a trip is not necessarily what would be regarded as a trip under that standard in terms of, um, we're probably looking at 50 mil generally, um, uh, so before we'd actually intervene. Um, certainly, um, it would have to be more than 50 mil if it was made, if it was gonna be a 48 hour repair and be put right in 48 hours. So if it's okay. dangerous life and limb, then it would be put right in 48 hours. In fact, actually, within two to four hours, if it's if it's considered really dangerous, like a, a bad pothole on the road or something like that, um, and you know, if, if a road, you know, quite often you get um, lorries driving on driving on the footpath, and you know, and it crushes everything and tips a foot, footpath upside down almost to the flags, and then we will be we'll be in there within within a few hours, within twenty four hours, um, at least at least probably within a couple of hours to cone it off, but you know the. the um, it's, a, it's a really difficult one um, because um, you know the the the, the, the as, as you as I said earlier, I mean we did sixteen thousand potholes in four months. Yeah. Um, I mean that is a phenomenal rate of repair. Um, so it's not for the want of want of trying. Um, it just really is um, um, the difficulty you have with the sort of what. 3,900 miles of road. Yeah, I, I, get, I get where you're coming. You don't have to, you know, I mean, I, I've got, for instance, uh, there's a big hole in the middle of the road, even the police go around it now, and that's been, it goes back from my way to the water board and everything else. But uh, parts of the city are more for the older generation. 
And I'd like you to take a trip down there and to see, because they're on their trolleys and boat. We have this terrible guy who, who keeps writing terrible letters. And we've all been out on sites with him. But anyway, I'm diversing a little bit because of everything else. It's just something I want to bring to your attention. So we all need checking now and again. And I know that sometimes these they come along, these contractors, we watch them, they just shove it in. They leave all the stones everywhere. And then we've got to get Count City out to clear it all up. You know, and, the, and then I was told it wasn't the right material they were using. You know, it, it's... Well, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, It's just something you know, to be on sometimes to check other people. Yeah. Hey, tap, hey, yeah. I mean, there was an old system called PUSWA, Public Utility Street Works Act, which was removed um, in favour of um, NERSWA, which is a new Rosa Street Works Act. Um, under PUSWA, um, we had real teeth uh, as, a, as an authority. Um, we, and, and it, to the point where we would reinstate for them. They could put a temporary reinstatement, but we would, we would go back and do the repair because it was our infrastructure that needed to be repaired. Yes. Under NERSWA, um, we don't have that right anymore. They can repair it themselves. And we get, we get a, a sort of tokenism amount of money to go around and check one in 25, I think it is, of, of, of sites it works out roughly. Um, and, and because, you know, it was done really because um, as it was, as it stood at that time, um, all of the statutory companies were going to be nationalised. And they were frightened that you couldn't nationalise those, those companies with that level of um, control weighted on, weighed on them by, by local authorities. So that's why it was released. But now you've got private companies that are responsible for their shareholders repairing the, repairing the public highway and footway. Um, you know, and that's one of the problems that has resulted from that. And Problem. really difficult to control. It really is. Um, you know, we've not got enough inspectors to, to stand on top of them to that level. OK, Colin, thank you very much for that explanation. Thank you. Um, where are we now? Any more questions, comments to make members? Before no more we... raised hands, Chairman. Before we move on to Siobhan, who will give us the COVID-19 update. Vaughan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hurst. Hopefully everybody can hear me and uh, I don't get cut off again like before. So apologies for that. Um, thank you all for inviting uh, us to talk about the COVID response. I think as the paper alludes to, um, it's been, and the word has been overused, but unprecedented uh, in its um size and impact on on the population not just in the uk but across the world and um, i think it's also been a huge challenge for every part of the council um and um you know colin's mentioned kind of some of his team members and uh, jane and i uh, worked very closely at the start of the pandemic trying to work out how we were going to get death registrations and things sorted so absolutely every part of the council has been involved from registrations libraries Trading standards, looking at um, uh, working with the environmental health officers on on uh, making sure that places are COVID safe, uh, children's services and how they visit people in their own homes, adult social care and supporting people in our care homes who were particularly badly hit at the start of the pandemic. Um, and GFRS uh, and provided us with all sorts of support in doing outreach to people for testing um, and so on. And then that's not even without, you know, haven't even started then on the partners that we've worked with, including the clinical commissioning group, the hospitals, the district councils, health and safety executive and public health England regionally. So, you know, a Herculean effort by uh, all partners across Gloucestershire system. Um, uh, sorry, I should also not forget the police and the military who were uh, fantastic at the start when uh, we were setting up our mobile testing units as well. So I'll take you very briefly through the... Uh, highlights of the paper. Um, again, you might wish to um, uh, speak to areas that I don't cover in any depth, or you might like to suggest areas that we'll bring back for future scrutiny. Um, but I'll start with uh, giving a bit of an outline of the two funding streams that we've received. So the first one is the Test and Trace Fund. Uh, that was given to uh, county councils or upper tier local authorities uh, in about June last year. And that was to supplement the initial response that public health teams had been undergoing locally um, and was designed to help get the resource into local context to deliver the national um, 
mandates at that point and that was including things like organizing the PPE supply locally, answering the queries from the public, taking the guidance that came nationally and ensuring that all partners received it and also responding to outbreaks at the local level. Um, since then there's been a further tranche of funding um, delivered which is called the Contain Outbreak Management Fund. I just must highlight there's an ever so slight error, I say slight, um, it's about a £3 million error unfortunately, it says £20 million. it's uh, actually uh, close to £17.5 million. Um, there was a, a, an a initial attribution of some extra funding that, that isn't actually uh, under Contain Outbreak Management, so there's approximately £17.5 million of Contain Outbreak Management Fund that's been given since um, the autumn last year. Um, and we can talk a little bit about how that's being used today, but I'd suggest that the committee might want something uh, later on in the year or perhaps early next year once those um, projects that have been funded under Contain Outbreak Management Fund have uh, been implemented and you can see the impact of those. So uh, to then go over the paper in general, um, so it talks about our local response and our local outbreak management plan, which was written with all of those partners in mind uh, that I've previously mentioned. Um, the four aspects of the uh, plan are to prevent uh, COVID-19, contain it, respond to any outbreaks or situations, and then monitor the COVID situation locally. And I'll start with the monitor section, but we will just uh, pay heed to the slides that have been circulated at the last minute, and I'll explain why they come out so late uh, in a moment. But um, at the end, Joe, maybe uh, once I finish this, we could go to the slides at the very end of the presentation and, and talk about those. So in terms of monitoring, we get um, at the start of the pandemic, the data was quite um, challenging to receive locally, uh, but a lot of um, local um, feedback to the government about what we needed to manage the situation locally was successful. And we now have good feeds uh, in terms of data from was somebody on mute there. Sorry. Just a bit of feedback. Um, so, yeah, we've got good data feeds now from the national team and we use the, the data to produce daily updates of the figures locally. Um, and also uh, we have access to the contact tracing systems nationally so we can spot trends. So, for example, uh, if we find out that um, somebody living on a particular street in Tewkesbury has visited a particular restaurant and there's, an out, uh, there's a case there, we can get our environmental health officers to go and do a bit of research and find out what the infection control procedures are like, which is really great. Um, and it also helps us to understand a little bit about the types of people who are getting COVID. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit later when we look at the slides. Um, the other part in that monitor section is about the variants of concern. Uh, when we wrote this report, Delta was still growing and it wasn't quite the dominant strain, but uh, you'll have seen clearly in the national press over the last couple of weeks that Delta variant, previously known as the variant that originated in India, um, has grown significantly and is now the dominant strain in the UK. Variants will happen from time to time. And I think one of the key parts about where we're at in the pandemic now is that um, although the people being affected, and again, we'll look at this later on, are younger, any excess spread of the, the bug can cause further variants to develop. And that's the risk for us as a country now, as we end up with a variant that um, the vaccine does not protect against. Uh, and that would be disaster for us, really. Whereas at the moment, the variants we've got are um, responding or well, the vaccines are responding well to the variants and making sure people are protected. But if we get uncontrolled spread in unvaccinated people, we could end up with a mutation into a new variant of concern. And that would be very concerning. So this is why our efforts have to continue, even though things are looking rosier, I guess, as a whole country. So we'll come back to that again shortly. So then moving on to prevent the key messages, you'll have seen them uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, the way to prevent the spread of COVID, along with many other infectious diseases, actually, is to maintain social distance, uh, wash your hands uh, thoroughly um, and to uh, cover your face with a face covering when uh, working uh, in proximity to others or, 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 for example, in shops. And then more recently, the importance of ventilation and fresh air has been highlighted, particularly now people are beginning to meet indoors again. So those remain our key headline messages and our comms team at the County Council do an excellent job of, of pushing out those messages repeatedly, in addition to the national uh, communications you will frequently see. Um, the second major strand uh, of our prevention uh, scheme, as you 
would would expect. Um, and Colin mentioned uh, the uh, interesting um, uh, developments in terms of uh, public health advances, but I would say vaccinations is up there with one of the best things that we could do for people. And um, as much as I agree with you, Colin, uh, clean water, etc., was important in this pandemic. It's definitely a medical vaccination that's the uh, the the one we need. So. Uh, uh, touche to that one <laughs> and uh, the committee will forgive me for that little uh, comment just because uh, I think you all know how important the vaccination programs have been this time and um, so we've got a few vaccines now approved in the UK the AstraZeneca one the Pfizer one and uh, the Moderna one and more recently the, John the Johnson and Johnson um, Johnson CLAG vaccine has also been approved which will be a single dose scheme Gloucestershire has done an amazing job of vaccinating uh, our population. Uh, when I last looked yesterday, we were well above the national averages in terms of our uh, uptake. So we've got around an 81% first dose at the moment, um, which is absolutely incredible. Um, we need to really get up to 85, 90 before we start to um, breathe a sigh of relief in terms of our vaccination uptake. The other thing just to mention that's really important at the moment is I mentioned the effectiveness of uh, vaccinations against the variants. Um, the Delta variant seems to um, need you to have two vaccinations before you're fully protected. If you only have one vaccination, the vaccine's not as effective against the Delta variant as it was against some of the earlier variants we were seeing. So that second dose is absolutely crucial. And if um, committee members can do anything as a result of today, it would be to promote in your local communities the importance of that second vaccine. Um, and I know there's concern from people around AstraZeneca, but if you've not had a bad reaction to the first one, it's highly unlikely the second one is going to give you any kind of reaction either uh, and definitely get the vaccine um, and the Pfizer one obviously I think is more widely accepted anyway so uh, please colleagues um, if you are able to uh, promote that that would be the best thing that you can do for the ongoing fight against the pandemic at the moment um, and then finally under the prevent section we talk about our measures to make events um, and places safe, COVID safe and secure, and talk about the visitor economy. And um, one of the biggest issues will be uh, people coming in and out of Gloucestershire um, and movement of, of people. Um, again, fine if people follow hands, face, space. But I do think we have to, you'll have all observed it yourselves, be realistic that the public feel um, like they've been trapped indoors, I think, for 16 months and are maybe uh, a little overzealous in their uh, celebrations of their new freedoms um, and perhaps uh, this is causing uh, spread to be a little quicker than, than we'd anticipated and again we will come back to the local figures uh, at the end of the presentation. The next section is on contain. This outlines our testing strategies um, and probably the movement really we've seen uh, in the country from only being able to test people in hospitals in the first wave um, and probably why then we were um, uh, not able to detect outbreaks quite as quickly probably in the community in the community in the first wave because it needed people to actually go to hospital before we could have the resource to test them just purely because of availability of the tests with this being a new disease uh, we didn't have that technology available had it been flu I think we'd have been in a very very different situation early on in the pandemic but that's what happens when you get a, a novel virus you have to work quickly to um, put in place the measures to detect and control the bug um, so uh, testing testing has got better um, but it, then it makes it a little bit misleading when you try and compare wave one to wave two to wave three as we're now going into uh, so just to bear that in mind the major uh, revelation I think in the last six months has been the introduction uh, to the wider community of lateral flow devices uh, which are uh, rapid tests that you can do at home um, and they take about 30 minutes to give you a result. Um, if you're very infectious, they're quite accurate. If you've only got a very, very low level of disease, they're not quite as good at picking up that you've got COVID. But nevertheless, it's a tool in the toolbox. And we're still absolutely recommending people test twice a week if they are going to be in high risk situations. Um, there is uh, hopefully a link in, in that presentation to the information, but uh, if not, if you go on the Gloucestershire County Council webpage and look at the testing web pages, you again can retweet that information or send that to your constituents. 
Um, and the main place now for people to get assisted testing, we did have four assisted testing sites in the county who would process the samples for you. We've actually closed those now because instead our pharmacies have valiantly taken up that uh, service. And so if you are perhaps partially sighted or have some sort of a disability, that means you would struggle to process the tests at home on your own or simply you just don't want to um you know, do it yourself, you can go to a pharmacy um, and pass your swab, do the swab in the pharmacy and pass it to the pharmacist and they'll process it all and, and sort out uh, your results and things. So that's really helpful. Uh, so uh, there's um, around 70 providers being trained at the moment in our pharmacies. And you can also collect tests from all 107 pharmacies in the county as well as ordering them online. So that's fantastic. I must just mention again here the, the, the fabulous support of the fire service, uh, particularly early in the pandemic and working with adult social care to make sure that we could get tests out to people who were homebound. Um, and, uh, you know, the county's huge. I used to work in Salford, which was about eight miles end to end. Uh, it's, it's a bit different going to a, a sort of 68 mile end to end county and trying to get tests to people who can't get uh, to the local hospital to be tested. So uh, GFRS were amazing, as were our colleagues at the uh, Gloucestershire Health and Care Trust, whose nurses uh, did go out to um, households across the county in the very early stages and, and swabbed people. So um, great team effort there. Um, the contain element also talks about our contact tracing offer. So this is done nationally in the main, although there's been more local devolution of this as the pandemic has progressed. Um, I do know that at the start of the pandemic, colleagues were calling for a more local offer. Uh, we simply weren't given the resource uh, over a year ago. It went to the national teams and the National Test and Trace Service was set up. However, there is increasing recognition of the benefits of doing contact tracing locally. Um, and we are starting to get slightly more funding to do that. And we can use some of the contain outbreak management funds to do it too. We're currently talking to districts um, and are hoping to employ some contact tracing workers to work uh, with each of the districts, but also provide surge capacity to each. Um, and uh, they will be able to, for example, go and knock on somebody's door and check they're OK. And then Colin talked about the welfare um, offer that we've got in the county, you know, so we can, again, make sure people can get food um, and medicines and things through that approach. Um, there was also an online help hub in early in the pandemic where people could ask for support. Uh, the web pages are still active, although there isn't a team answering the calls so much anymore but every query that comes through those pages will still get responded to so there is still county-wide support available so then moving on to the last section of the plan uh, is our respond part and this is what happens when we actually uh, haven't managed to prevent or contain the spread and we start to get the outbreaks appearing uh, i've mentioned already um, again, this is a partnership approach and we, we look particularly at our high risk settings um, and our high risk settings are places where either spread will occur quickly or the consequences of that spread uh, would be quite severe. So, for example, schools are high risk because they will uh, have lots of concentration of, of people who can't always socially distance because of the nature of the, the setting um, and will spread the virus, um, but equally, obviously, care homes have been a massive focus for our teams in the county um, because of the consequences of getting COVID if you're older um, and the number of deaths that, that we've seen, obviously, in care homes across the country. Um, I am so pleased to say that because of the uh, uptake in the vaccinations, and I know we covered the social care vaccination earlier when I got cut off, um, but because of the uptake in our care homes, uh, our deaths have dropped in our care homes to zero, and we have not seen a death in a care home for uh, of co from COVID for a good few weeks now, which is absolutely what we need. Um, and uh, again, when we talk to the slides shortly, I'll, I'll just highlight that uh, fact again. So a uh, very important um, part of our response there. And we've also got an infection prevention control team now funded by that contain outbreak management fund who are going around care homes and making sure that uh, they're ready for the winter pressures that will come. We expect flu will come back. And because flu wasn't in the community last year, we may have lowered immunity. So uh, flu vaccination will become very important in those care homes now as a preventative measure for the winter because we may save them from COVID, but we don't want them then to be affected by flu as well. Uh, other high risk settings are particular types of workplaces, for example, uh, migrant uh, workers um, on fruit farms. Uh, we've got a couple of outbreaks on some fruit farms at the moment in the county. Um, and then uh, um, 
other uh, settings might be, for example, events where we know that people are going to be mixing, etc. So we work very closely with a range of, of partners there, uh, specifically the districts, environmental health officers, trading standards and the health and safety executive are really uh, key in making sure that those places are safe to, to visit and go to. Um, and then just in terms of other response things we've done uh, during the pandemic, we'd um, housed every single or gave an offer of housing to every single roof sleeper in the county um, and have been able to support over 300 planned moves from the, that emergency accommodation to wider parts of the system, um, which has been incredible. Um, and I think it's highlighted the need for that wider partnership to continue to strengthen their approach and uh, make sure that nobody has to sleep rough in Gloucestershire uh, moving forward um, of course it's a long way to go and a lot of services still need to be put in place to support people um, and the uh, end of the eviction ban may mean that we see more people uh, being becoming homeless in the next few months so absolutely our housing services across the districts um, and our support work that we commission at the county are remaining vigilant uh, mental health We've uh, commissioned four new services. One was a helpline for children. Uh, there was also online counselling for both adults and children and one-to-one -one mental health uh, counselling for people who had been particularly affected by the pandemic. Um, delighted to say that the Contain Outbreak Management Fund has meant that we've able to extend those services further um, and we'll review demand uh, of those and look at uh, long-term plans for that kind of offer. I think what's become clear in the pandemic is the need for resilience in our communities um, and things like this help to build that resilience moving forward. Um, and then uh, the community engagement has been central to our local offer. Um, and again, thank you to all of the community champions um, and our councillors for the inroads that we've had into communities because of our links. Um, the community engagement has consisted particularly in the Barton Treadworth area, for example, of webinars um, and using community champ champions to go out and spread the message uh, and not the virus uh, about what we can do to support them. Um, so they've been absolutely key. And then the final section of the paper, which I'm sure uh, you, you, you will appreciate is about then that impact um, and Sarah mentioned before around prevention, well-being communities and the work we've always done around inequalities. But this pandemic has just shown how much uh, it affects you if you haven't got a good home, a good education, um, you know, good support networks, uh, a good job, uh, the gig economy and the effect on our uh, people who, you know, have, you know, the the, the the fact that furlough has saved people's um, income, you know, has been so important. But we've now got a recovery to go through where people uh, may well uh, lose jobs uh, as the economy maybe takes a downturn or, or be, become made homeless, etc. as that support ends. So we have a real um, opportunity to uh, ensure that people understand the importance of uh, inequality and make sure we build back fairer. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have to be cognizant that there are kind of forces at work uh, in terms of the impact of the pandemic that we will need to be mindful of as we move forward over the next few months. So that's the main paper uh, covered. Um, and Joe, I wondered if you just wanted to pop up the slides and I'll talk through where we are today. So while Joe's doing that, um, these slides are part of our monitor uh, uh, framework. Um, they are can be produced um, at any time, uh, which is why we send them the day before, because if we'd have put these figures in the reports that we prepared a few weeks ago for the deadlines for this committee, they would have been very out of date and it would have presented a very rosy picture. Um, and I don't think we are, are there now. Uh, so the purpose of this is that you do get the paper quite late, unfortunately, but equally it gives you the most up-to-date picture we can present for you. Uh, so, uh, Joe, if you can go to, uh, let me just check this, uh, not that one, the next one, please. Um, it, oh, it's not moving. <laughs> oh no, it's taking you out. Do you want to cancel that one down and go back to the presentation? That one. Thank you, Joe. That's perfect. So this is the latest picture. Um, you will see uh, that we have got the um, totals for each of the districts uh, there. If you look at the third column along, that gives you the latest uh, cases in the last seven days uh, up till yesterday. Um, you can see that we now have quite a high case rate in three districts in particular, Cheltenham, uh, Gloucester and Tewkesbury, um, a much lower rate in other parts of the county, Stroud, Cotswold and the Forest of Dean. Um, 
and our total case number is around 576. Just to give you a bit of a comparison um, and to remember, as I said, that testing is more prevalent now than it was earlier in the pandemic. But back in January, the first week in January, we were dealing with around 2,250 cases per week. So, yes, it's high, but it's not as high as we have been. Um, and equally, testing is, is more commonplace now. So what we are doing is able to pick up uh, in schools, for instance, almost every case, whereas back in January, we were only picking up um, the, the cases that were symptomatic. So just bear that in mind when, when looking at the figures. That's not to do down the fact that our average uh, rate is 90 cases per 100,000 population in the county county, which does make us higher now than the southwest average, which is currently sitting at around 76,000 mark, sorry, 76 per 100,000 mark. And the national average is actually 89.9. Uh, so it puts us slightly higher than that England national average. Um, and that's the first time we've been above that England uh, national average, um, I think, for uh, certainly in, in, in recent uh, weeks. So we are um, seeing quite a lot of increase. Um, I will caveat that with uh, this is mainly in the 10 to 29 year old age group um, and that that is because those young people are not vaccinated uh, so clearly spread will happen as we talked about before if you don't have a, a vaccine um, and even if you have a single dose you can still get uh, COVID uh, well even if you've got two doses you can still get COVID but the impact is much much less um, and obviously the, uh, if you are unvaccinated you are uh, definitely more susceptible um, but to reassure you, when you look at those rates, that is for the whole population, for our whole age range. If you looked at the rates for the county for just those aged over 60, the southwest average is 10 per 100,000 as opposed to uh, 72 per 100,000. And the Gloucestershire average is 11 per 100,000. So uh, compared to an England average of 16 per 100,000. So I think that shows you that if you are over 60, and we know that most of the over 60s in the county have had two doses now, uh, that you do have protection against getting COVID. Um, and that is really, really important. So it comes back to that part about the spread we are seeing is in the younger population. Now, it doesn't mean we can wash wash up and go home and say we're all done. It doesn't matter that it spreads in the young people because as I mentioned before, if it does spread too much, we could see another variant. So we're still doing everything we can to address these outbreaks. The Cheeksbury one, for example, 34 of those 97 cases are in one school. Uh, and Gloucester uh, also has a large outbreak uh, in the Hartbury area at the moment. So quite a lot of these um, uh, figures are driven by specific outbreaks where we know there's been spread. But that's not to say there isn't community spread at the moment. And we are uh, cognizant of that. But as you will know, that is uh, also happening across the, the country. Um, so, yes, uh, we are aware. Yes, it's not good news, but it's not as concerning perhaps as it might first appear when you consider our great vaccine performance. Uh, so, Joe, if we can just, um, I'm not going to go through the slide deck in detail. I do just want to go to the um, to the next slide with the map. Thank you. That just gives you um, the med medium or middle super output areas. These are smaller areas. They're a little bit bigger than a ward, but smaller than a district, about 7,500, 8,000 people per middle super output area. Um, and they give you kind of the uh, density of those cases. So you can see there that Gloucester has definitely got that hot spot uh, in the middle. Uh, the very dark red one um, and it is patterned across the, the counties as you can see so that's sometimes quite a helpful graph for yourselves to look at in your uh, localities so you can see uh, where the cases are and if you go on the national website you can actually drill down to um, a lower super output area um, on those national websites. I would just caution the smaller your denominator so the smaller the number of people you look at the more those case rates can seem very high. Um, so you might have a, uh, a small um, ward of say 500 people and one case rate, one, one person can then make that rate look very, very high. So just bear that in mind. And then Joe, if we can just move to the uh, final slide for me, um, that one, thank you. Oh, sorry, the, the one before. Thank you, that's perfect. Uh, this just emphasizes that bit I was saying about the deaths. 
So if you look in uh, the first wave at the end of May, you can see how high our deaths were at the start of the pandemic uh, as treatments have improved and also um, understanding of how to control the spread improved. Those deaths did decrease in, in November uh, through to March in Gloucestershire, but sadly, a lot of people still did die. Um, but you can see that despite our case rates being high, we have had a couple of deaths in the community, sadly, uh, but none in our hospitals uh, and none in our care homes. So that is really, really important. And as I say, does show that our vaccination programme is working. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, Councillor Hurst, I'm more than happy to take questions. Sarah is also still available for anything. Hopefully that was a helpful overview. You're muted, Stephen. Thank you, Shimon. That was a really riveting presentation. Yeah. which um, showed in good detail the, the true situation of what's happening with COVID-19 in our county. Does anyone have any questions? Kate? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Siobhan. I was really glad that you did mention the community response volunteers because I think they have mm -hmm. just been a massively valuable resource, really. And... Um, I just wondered if any work is being done to sort of keep those networks that have been created um, because they are, they have, I think, proved themselves really about um, creating, well, more re resilient, supportive communities. And I think that's, that came out to me in, in the papers that we read, how that, that's something that, that um, clearly is, is, is something that we need to do in order for, um, for all of this to work, that you, that we do need this community support and and for people to stay in their own homes and all that sort of thing, I think residents will certainly here felt really safe and supported. And I just wondered if there's anything that we're going to do to keep those networks um, growing. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Cody. It's a really good question. Um, absolutely, I think we see that um, it really gives the emphasis to what we call like a place-based approach, whereby it's about the places people live, um, and sometimes our geographical boundaries don't always match what people see as their local community. Um, so absolutely cognizant of that. Um, do you remember I mentioned that there's the 17 and a half million contain outbreak management fund? Uh, one and a, just approximately 1.2 million has been allocated to community grants for that. Uh, so that is through the voluntary community sector. Uh, Di Billingham in our team has been uh, administering those. We've already allocated over 750,000 and there's another um, 250,000 bids already in. Um, and again, that's where I was mentioning you might want to further update at scrutiny um, uh, in future about, you know, how that's been spent and what, what exactly that's been spent on. Um, there will also be a councillor grant scheme uh, being launched for uh, a county councillors to work with their constituents on allocating some funding. We're hoping to uh, present that to Cabinet um, very soon um, and that should then go live later in the year. So again, that's about how you then use your knowledge and um, uh, understanding of your local patches to to supplement that that support. Um, so that's kind of, uh, it's over, uh, it'll be uh, approximately 2 million investment, just, just under 2 million investment from that 17 and a half million. Um, in addition, we are commissioning some research from a company um, called Ice Creates to work with the Barton and Treadworth community in particular to ask them what worked with that community champions approach and to capture that. And then we can disseminate it across other parts of the county um, and then use some of the uh, community grants to hopefully um, stimulate and set, set up similar uh, moving forward. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, but if you do need any more information, please do drop me a line and I can put you in touch with Di, who can give you a bit more of the granular detail on those grants. Great. Stephen? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Siobhan. Um, you mentioned about the, the Delta variant and how, it, how important two doses are and for us to help with that where we can to put it out in our, in our divisions. Um, I didn't quite click uh, here, you mentioned eighty-five percent. Was that the 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 people that had had uh, one vaccine, or was it two vaccines? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. No, that's fine. That's fine. So uh, we've had eighty-one percent when I looked yesterday oh. had had the first dose, um, and that's across all age ranges that have been offered it currently. 
Um, so that's fantastic. Um, the 85% I was referring to is kind of the aspirational figure that we need to at least get to, if that makes sense. Obviously, the higher, the better. But uh, certainly, you know, we need to be getting over 85 before we can even start to think we've kind of got enough people for what we call herd immunity, uh, which is when there's enough people vaccinated to stop spread. Um, the figure's not completely clear, but but certainly we've still got a little way to go yet. Um, and the point about the second vaccine uh, was that um, one dose does protect you quite well against that alpha variant, the one we were seeing around Christmas time, but not so well against Delta. So that second dose, if you have it um, against the Delta variant, if you have two doses, um, the Pfizer vaccine uh, is a 96% effectiveness against hospitalisation and the AstraZeneca is 93% effective against hospitalisation. So really good, but only if you have both doses. Okay. Do we have any idea how many people, any, how many eligible, any, uh, eligible adults have had two vaccines? Uh, we do. If you give me a second, I will get you that figure. Just bear with me one second. If somebody wants to ask the next question uh, while I'm finding it, I will find you that figure. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask Tim Harmon, who's the portfolio holder for um, public health and such things, if he wants to make a comment? Yeah, I think I should put my electronic hand up, so I'll, I'll wave it off. Thank you for letting me say that. Can I thank Trevor and the team? A couple of things, if I can. <clears throat> I think throughout the meeting today, members and perhaps particularly the new members will have got an idea of the involvement of county care in so many aspects. We saw it in Colin's report, we saw it earlier on in Sarah's report with, with the pandemic. But I think I think the team locally have done a great job. Um, and we are obviously aware of the fact we do have some rising numbers. I wondered if Siobhan might want to just comment on what we understand to be the latest position in hospitals. In our, in our Gloucester hospitals, where my understanding is that um, you know, there's clearly a great difference between where we are now and where we were with the pandemic some months ago. Thank you, Jim. Sorry, trying desperately to multitask. <laughs> Uh, yes. So um, uh, thank you, Tim, for, for raising that question. Yeah, and it's a very good point. And uh, one of the last graphs I showed in the uh, slides you got yesterday was about that, that hospital um, uh, admission rate. Um, so, yes, we were seeing uh, an awful lot of hospital admissions, uh, particularly in the first wave, but then again, also in the second wave. Um, and I think um, it's an interesting situation right now because we have very, very few admissions to hospitals. I think the last uh, figure I saw was uh, five, I believe it was, yesterday uh, in our hospitals in Gloucestershire, which is a very, very low number compared to uh, earlier in the year. Um, I think the, and most of those will, will have had uh, uh, either zero or one vaccine, as I as I said before. So if you're doubly vaccinated, you're very unlikely to be in hospital at the moment. Um, I think the key part is, though, is that thinking about the, the roadmap decision and part of the reason the government did delay is although the hospital admissions are lower, the NHS is under significant pressure to catch up uh, on uh, all of the operations and um, uh, presentations that people are now uh, making because they um, missed them during the pandemic. So we've got a lot of late cancer diagnoses. Uh, we've got um, a lot of uh, things like strokes and heart attacks now coming through the system because people waited during the pandemic to get that care or couldn't because of the, the lockdown. That's now starting to take its toll on the NHS services. I think we're very lucky in Gloucestershire. We've got a very good trust that's managed very well throughout the pandemic. There have been other trusts in the southwest and nationally that have really, really struggled with their bed base and meant that they have become overwhelmed very, very quickly. So uh, part of the, the government um, thinking around this is that it will only take a few extra uh, hospital admissions to tip some of those hospitals over. So although our local hospitals are coping very well um, and we've got very few COVID admissions um, and our uh, director of uh, medical, the medical director of the hospital, Mark Pietroni, has said, you know, they're in a very good position. Um, I do know that that's not the case, for example, in some of the northern hospitals. So that's just kind of the, the context behind that. But yes, uh, thank you, Tim. You're absolutely right to point out that the number of hospitalisations has massively reduced and our, our hospital service have done a fantastic job of, of managing, uh, particularly because they've had to reduce their bed base because yeah. of social distancing and so on uh, to, to manage throughout the pandemic. I don't know, Sarah, if you wanted to add anything from, from your perspective. I don't think you've covered it all. Thank you.
And while we were doing that, I also found the numbers. So uh, the national number is uh, 81 point, uh, six for first dose and 59.5 for second dose. Gloucestershire is 81% for first dose and 61.2% for second dose. So slightly ahead on the second doses, ever so slightly behind on those first doses. But, you know, we won't we won't we won't say that uh, we're doing very, very well nationally and, and are, have been leading across the southwest and the country in terms of uptake for some time. So we should be very proud of our, our health colleagues. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you. Do we have any more questions or comments? Yeah, may I? You may, Pam. <laughs> On a lighter base, thank you for a wonderful presentation. How, um, I've got a question to come after this, but I've just thought of how, how do you put all these graphs together? It must take ages. To, is it sent to you or do your team put them all? It's absolutely wonderful how you, you, know, you present them to us all. Pam, I will pass that feedback on. Honestly, Councillor Tracy, you have no idea what that will mean to the team. It has been a labour uh, getting this right. Um, oh. we've, had to, we've had to do some significant investment, it has to be said, in, in some software to support this um, and make sure that those data feeds feed through. But uh, Rob Ailis' team, who uh, manage the uh, intelligence function, um, and our public health team have worked uh, tirelessly throughout the pandemic to make this yeah. kind of dashboard work for people. So um, I'm delighted to hear that you found it of value. Um, and I think that we've learned a lot about how to present data during the pandemic that we'll hopefully take forward into to future uh, scrutiny um, moving forward. So thank you for the compliment. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm no doubt they'll be delighted. I'm sure everybody will be delighted. And I'm not sure if I'm listening to Mark Cummins in the morning or Sarah sometimes when I pick the radio off with all <laughs> Oh, you must work endlessly. I think you're up for a pay rise, aren't you? But anyhow, uh, just a quick question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, track and trace. Uh, say you enter a restaurant and uh, you go in, and you might only be there about 10 minutes to do a booking or, or whatever, and, and they put your name down. Or you could be in there where people have been there all day and you only go in for an hour. How how does you know is that tracking trace we're still all included on that? Not as I do this, it's a question I've got asked. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's I'm, a, in a, I'm in your house, right? Tracking trace, some of it in there all day. I come in to pop in and say hello, happy birthday, then come out. But I'm still on that tracking trace. Yeah, so I would th say it's probably one of the um least well communicated aspects of the of the app uh, so far which is a shame um so there are two well, there are three parts to the app uh, the first part is a bluetooth proximity tracker which you turn on and if you uh, are nearby somebody for a particular length of time it measures how far you are and how long you are in proximity from that person for if that person is then uh, tested positive as a case you get a notification saying you've been in contact with that case so that's done on the bluetooth bit of your phone the, the, the QR code you scan when you go into restaurants, all that does is provide a list of people that were in the venue at that time. It isn't used to tell people that they were in contact with a case. What might happen is you might get, um, we, we might be able to request um, a, an email to be sent to everybody in a venue a particular time if we felt that there was a significant outbreak, but it doesn't tell you, oh, you've been in contact with the case, you need to isolate for exactly the reasons you say, because you might have been in at lunchtime and then the person who was the case came in at five o'clock. So uh, that part of the QR code doesn't do that. It just gives us a provision to uh, sort of warn and inform. The first part is much more about that contact tracing. The most reliable method we have is actually ringing people and speaking to them using the track and trace system. So if you are a, a case and you test positive, you get a phone call and you say, I popped into Siobhan's house to say happy birthday and then I left again. And they will say to you, how long were you there for? How far away were you? Did you wash your hands, uh, et cetera? And you'd say yes. And they'd say, don't worry, you're not a contact. So that's how it that's the best way we have to make it work. The app is a supplementary tool to add to the contact tracing system. Does that help? Oh, yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah. Uh, it takes a bit to sink in. But also, <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't do it on the phone. You know, you go and rest no. your, you don't use your phone to do track and trace. 
Yeah, so in that case, Public Health England, who are soon to become the UK uh, Health Security Agency, uh, they would work with the venue to get the list of details um, and would do it manually rather than automatically if we needed to do warn and inform. I have okay. to say, we haven't yet had a situation where we've needed to do that because the contact tracing where you actually speak to the person who is the case is probably more effective at making sure we find who people have been in touch with. Yeah. Uh, so that's the main method we rely on. It's almost a fail safe, I think, is the best way to think of it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank that's you. a pleasure. Any questions Thank like that, please do email us. In fact, I'll drop the um, duty team's email in the chat. So if people do have questions, you have a contact. Yeah, Thank you. Could, you, could you email it as well, Shiv, on to myself and I'll share it. Yeah, that's we, great. Yeah. I think we've just got one more question, um, Chair, from Kate, and then we do need to move on to the performance report. You're going to get Kate. Very briefly, um, I just wondered if we know what percentage of people do use the app. Do we have any idea? Unfortunately not, Kate. The only thing we'd be able to do would be to look at total number of downloads, but um, it's incredibly difficult to kind of track that to to whether or not people are actually using them. Um, it's, um, um, I think we've all got a desire for things to be more joined up in future and we will take a lot of learning from this pandemic and, and one of them will be around the app and the way it was implemented and how we could have done perhaps with more local information from it. Um, so unfortunately we don't get that information at the moment. There's also ju just... Um... You know, not everybody uses phones and apps, and in fact, some people are coming off them. So, you know, we're always going to have certain people that we can't, uh, um, that that just aren't in the same. In the, the words have all gone mad. Um, I know yeah, exactly, I know exactly what you mean. There's, yeah. the, it's the digital divide, and we need to address that wider. And um, so, there's definitely something about that. But equally, that's the bit I was mentioning about a local team being much better placed, because if you can't get hold of somebody uh, via an app, you can go and knock on the door. And actually, sometimes that's the best way to do it. So, it comes back to what you were saying about that community and place-based approach. What we want to move towards moving forward. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you again. Um, and we now move on to um, item number five on our agenda, which is performance reporting. It's Kelly. Oh, yeah. Kelly has Kelly been very Kelly has been very patient, and thank you, Kelly, patient, for doing this. But now the starter's gun has gone off. Kelly, can we have your offering, please, regarding? Reporting. Yes, thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me okay? It just went a little bit glitchy then. So. It did, didn't it? If, if it does go a little bit um, fuzzy, it, we just turn the video off. And if, if you might, you want, you might want to turn your video off. But you're okay at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to share a presentation with you uh, and and run through an overview of. Um, uh, performance and risk management framework at GCC. Is that, is that starting to share? Oh, there we go. Is that... Yes, we can, we're getting something now, Kelly. Right, okay, lovely. Hopefully. If not, oh, there it is. We can see it. Thank you. Lovely. Okay. Uh, so I'm just waiting for it to catch up uh, and move on to the next next slide for me. <laughs> okay. So um, we have a, a strategic planning uh, framework uh, in the council. So everything starts from here um, and it begins with our, our council strategy, uh, which provides us with our four-year direction, um, our strategic direction and is reviewed annually. And that's, that sets out the, uh, the corporate direction and the priorities. So each year, uh, the priorities within the council strategy are then translated into uh, the commissioning and change activity, which make up our commissioning intentions, and also into our service plans, which uh, detail the objectives 
uh, that services need to achieve, uh, as well as strategic and operational performance measures and risks. So that creates the golden thread uh, from, from the council strategy right down to an individual's work. Um, and that, that framework is informed by a number of inputs, such as um, the political mandate, um, evidence of changing need, national policy, um, performance benchmarking, governance and emerging risks and so on. Oh, <laughs> we're done there. Hang on. Okay, I, <laughs> I appear to be missing a slide here, but I'll, I'll talk you through it anyway. So um, this is then um, how our performance uh, and risk management framework uh, works. So we have uh, quarterly data, uh, which is collated by uh, services following the close of the quarter, and that's usually sort of around a two week period. Uh, and then that information is discussed at director, directorate leadership team meetings. Um, to ensure that performance is owned and managed both operationally and strategically within each service area. Um, and then as part of our internal support and challenge process, the corporate leadership team receive a corporate performance report, uh, scorecard and presentation from the Director of Policy, Performance and Governance. And that supports the collective understanding of issues uh, pressures and risks um, and the cross service impacts of those and how they may impact service delivery of the council's objectives. The next layer um, is the finance performance and risk meetings. So those involve the uh, chief officers and the cabinet members for each directorate. And then um, the scrutiny committees uh, then form the next layer of governance. Uh, in the framework. So that's holding us to account um, through independent support and challenge. Okay, so in terms of selecting the uh, indicators that go into the corporate performance data set, um, these should be relevant. So um, what are we trying to achieve? Um, and those are developed in line with the council strategy and key priorities. Where possible, they should be outcome based. Um, so that means sort of measuring strategic changes for communities. It's, it's important to have regular and current site of performance so that it's clear whether we're making process, uh, sorry, progress against our objectives. So the majority of indicators are um, available quarterly for the latest quarter. Um, some some are reported a quarter in arrears, and obviously, you know, some some of the uh, indicators are um, sort of more annual information, say um, uh, exam passes for children in schools. So we aim for um, corporate performance measures also to be benchmarkable, uh, where this information is available. So that's um, where we can compare ourselves to other authorities. So that gives us a, a common definition so that we know that we're measuring performance in the same way as others and helps us to understand our performance in the context of how similar local authorities are, are performing. OK, so the, the majority of measures in the corporate performance data set will have a target. Um, so that means that it's much clearer for people under, to understand how we should be performing. Uh, a, a small number of measures don't have a target. So this may be because a measure's new um, and we're trying to get a performance baseline um, established before we can decide what that target should look like or the indicator may be included to provide some additional information um, supporting the, the sort of the understanding of performance in its broader context. So um, benchmarking using uh, comparator peer groups, so um, uh, local authorities that have a similar structure, structure to us 
um, and areas with similar features to our own or national and regional trends and pressures should also be used to guide um, setting uh, target setting discussions. And it should also um, take into account um, and stretch us to meet our aspirations. Understanding historic performance and the blockers to attain our targets will also inform target setting. And um, our ambition should also match our investment. So if there's um, investment that's been in a, made in an area um, through our, our sort of MTFS process, our budget process, then we would expect to see that translated into improved performance and should be setting targets accordingly. Um, targets are subject to objective challenge. So um, that's from our team, which um, is centralised and we support the whole of the organisation. Uh, and we do have an independent assurance and challenge role. Uh, and they can also be challenged by um, our corporate leadership team and, of course, from members. OK, so um, this committee uh, received a quarterly scorecard um, of the um, the corporate data set measures for the areas that you're responsible for. Um, and, it, and then generally a, a highlight presentation from uh, from the sort of the chief officers, the lead officers. Um, <coughs> um, you would also get your um, your strategic risk register as part of that um, scorecard as well. Um, and as part of that um, uh, agenda item, you would have the opportunity to. Um, oh, sorry, I've moved myself on. <laughs> uh, you would also have the opportunity to ask questions and raise challenges uh, or commend successes, um, because reporting generally focuses on exceptions, uh, which do include successes as well as concerns. So the information that you receive, receive by the uh, scorecard um, is aimed at helping the committee to understand progress against delivering the priorities within the council strategy. OK, so this is an example of the scorecard that you'll see. It's not as um, pretty as the lovely dashboard that Siobhan had uh, on screen earlier. Uh, we are. Uh, gradually moving towards uh, Power BI platforms to present all of our performance information. Uh, the pandemic came along and, and took priority in terms of uh, getting some of those dashboards up together. Um, and we are currently working on um, children's and adults at the moment. Um, our corporate performance uh, will be in the next phase along with uh, community safety. So um, just some, some key points on the screen there for you as to what the, the performance scorecard will tell you. Uh, so it will give you information as to which direction performance needs to travel in to show an improving picture. It will also indicate whether performance is uh, better than target or not um, through the, the little symbol there um, and whether the measure can be benchmarked. Uh, if the uh, target is uh, performing significantly worse than targets, so that's outside of a 5% tolerance. You should expect to see some information in the scorecard explaining our understanding of, of why that's the case and what remedial actions are being taken. And if performance is stuck or deteriorating, um, uh, that should receive attention and scrutiny. Uh, the basis on which measures is uh, are reported is also included to help you understand whether um, performance is based on everything that happened during a quarter or whether it's a snapshot at the end of the quarter or uh, cumulatively accruing across the financial year, that type of thing. OK, so um, the, the other part of the scorecard is your risk register. Um, so this is the, the strategic risks, and you will see uh, on the left hand side of the table uh, the initial risk score. Um, so that's the level of risk if we simply did nothing. Um, and then you'll see the, the current risk score based on the mitigating actions that we're taking. 
um, and that risk score is based on the probability of the risk happening and the impact of it doing so. Uh, and then also included is, is your sort of trend over time there and your direction of travel um, as to whether the, the risk is getting worse or better. Um, and some, some comments again on the actions that are being taken. Okay, so I've just popped some questions up on the screen um, that you might want to have a think about um, in terms of your role when challenging performance at these committee meetings. Just around whether we are focusing on the right areas, um, whether performance has changed for a specific area and whether we understand why that is. Um, the implications of not meeting a target and again that sort of wider wider picture um and then you know what's performance telling us overall um so that will be be something that um the directors will sort of um uh give you in their presentations sort of weaving all of the the measures into a story um you know the, they they combine to say uh, you know, what, what is happening for the people of Gloucestershire and, and where are any concerns? So, and, uh, you know, and do feel free to, um, to, to challenge us um, and challenge uh, assumptions that are made as well. And there's just some contacts there. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm the manager of the performance and improvement team. And then Darren Skinner is the head of our planning performance and improvement team um, with uh, Rob Ayliff sitting above us there, Director of Policy, Performance and Governance. Okay, I hope that's been helpful. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You're muted, Steve. Thank you, Kelly. We'll now wait to see if we have any questions. I hope we do, because um, this really is what switching is all about, looking at trends and understanding why those trends are happening. I think that the, the information Kelly's given us there sets the scene for um, future scrutiny um, and to look at the performance reports and how to um, assess the performance reports. Members have been given the quarter three performance report. If there's any questions on, on quarter three performance, that's fine. But at the next meeting, which is in two weeks, on the 6th of July, you'll be having the quarter four performance report. So it may be that you want to um, take away this information and prepare yourself um, for noting and considering quarter four. Um, but if there are any questions now, um, please, please ask them. I think Kate wants to ask a question. Yes, Kate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just wondered if we could have that a copy of that slide. I'm not sure we had that one in the pack. Uh, that was very useful, that focusing on the right areas, et cetera, et cetera. Could we have a copy of that, please? Yes, we'll get arranged that for that to present to all members. Thank you. And also, Chair, may I ask for a copy of what uh, Colin did, uh, Clip, with all the information of all who to contact and everything else so uh, that would be very helpful to us yes indeed yes yeah but also arrange that you receive that thank you so i, I will much. send out all the information to everyone that you've seen today have we let kelly off lightly by not having thank any you. questions thank you so much kelly i, I re we really appreciate that that's given us a good ground into take forward and prepare for the quarter four performance report. I suggest we just note quarter three. If there are any questions after the meeting, um, if you want to email them to me, and then I will forward them on and get responses. But thank you, Kelly, that was really useful. Yes, thank you. We now move on to our last item, which is work planning. How do we want to approach this, Joe? Well, I think we've we've got some really um, useful um, suggestions as possible items going forward. Um, we have got the meeting in two weeks, July uh, the 6th, which is really um, possibly and definitely too tight to turn around to get reports ready for publication with the agenda for that meeting. So my understanding 
from Sarah and from um, the other officers is that you will have an update on information that you've received today and from the various um, service areas. You'll have a, another update. You'll have the quarter four performance report and possibly a, a good um, sort of look at the work programme for the rest of the year. Um, but from today's meeting, um, and I'm just going to share this with you and to see whether the committee agree that these are items that they want to think about putting onto the work programme. The first one, I think, Sarah, was um, from your report, which was the market management um, uh, sort of discussion, uh, including a piece on staffing issues, pay, training, recruitment, retention, etc., and possibly think about that for the September meeting. Am I correct in that, Sarah? So that's an item if the committee feel that that will be useful. And I think it will probably be um, quite a, 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 a significant topic to take forward and look at over time. This is something that probably the committee will want to look at going forward. So that's one item. And I will share these with you after the session. Uh, Don Care was another one, Sarah. Is that right? Um, maybe another item. Hillary Care, yes. Yeah. Um, and then from Siobhan's reports uh, or update was the uh, container break management funding. Is that, is that right, Siobhan? Uh, and that might be later in the year, maybe at the November meeting, maybe in the new year. And then uh, it is that the same as, as COVID funding grant schemes update? Is that the same thing or is that slightly different? So the COVID grant schemes has come out of the container outbreak management fund. Fine. So you might want a smaller one on the grant scheme specifically because then Di can go into quite a bit of detail and then perhaps yeah. an overview one of the whole COVID outbreak management fund and all of the projects under okay. it. So yeah. the grants one could come sooner I suspect because Di is well on with giving that out. So Brilliant, thank you. So there's four um, topics there that I'm happy to share after the meeting. Chairman um, and committee, would you think it would be useful to look at the work programme in more detail with any more suggestions at the July the 6th meeting, which is in two weeks' time. What do you think, members? I think it would be a good idea myself. And in the meantime, if there's any suggestions that you feel, if you've looked at the reports, if you take away from you today, if there's any suggestions, if you want to email them in, I will slot them into the list of suggestions for consideration um, at the July meeting. Okay. Sarah, did you want to add anything at all? Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Lisa, did you want to say something? Okay, thank you. Stephen, can I yes, say Stephen. something? Yeah. Um, Sarah said that she was going to come back with some some more information, perhaps at the October meeting regarding um, the uh, care homes and, uh, you know, places available and whether we had um, too many still and, and, and an update on that um, for us under the work programme. Yeah. Some way that's, that's managing the market, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so we'll we'll bring an update in the September meeting that covers that, and um, to sort of try and, and articulate our plans going forward. Yeah. Uh, could I also ask Stephen? I've been asked by uh, group members um, in our group regarding the um, setting up of a task and finishing group, and whether that will involve uh, um, adult social care regarding the. Um, you know, the Cheltenham Festival and the ongoing issues that may have occurred due to that with COVID. Um, and I see in, in HOSC that it was, it was about setting up a task and finish group. Are we being involved in that as well? I don't think we are, although there's little you could do about last year's Cheltenham, Fe or this year's Cheltenham Festival. Do you want me to just update members on, on that a little bit? Um, and uh, Sarah might help me here, but... Um... At the last HOSC meeting, or certainly um, one of the March HOSC meetings, the committee requested that a letter be sent to Public Health England um, asking a series of questions. That letter went to Public Health England, and I know, I believe, that they are looking into uh, response. 
So we're awaiting the response. And until I think Hoss get that response, then I think there's no um, decision on how uh, the committee are wanting to take that forward. Um, but I would certainly say that um, adult social care will be involved. Sarah, did you want to add to that? I think because we, we've, we've answered many questions on Chant Festival in 2020, because it wasn't a decision taken locally or by anyone in the councils to whether that festival went ahead, I think we need to seek some advice about what a task and finish group would actually do. What would it be seeking to achieve? Because it was a national issue and a decision that was taken at a national level and, and by the, the organisers themselves, what would be we, what would the outcome be of a task and finish group? And that um, the, we provided an answer uh, to Steve Lydon's questions for HOSC and that maybe it would be helpful to share with members, Joe. Um, and then, of course, copied the letter that went to Public Health England from Stephen signed as the then chair of HOSC. Might be helpful yeah. background for, for, for members. Yeah, I will. I'll share that. Um, it was Steve. I think it was Steve Lydon's suggestion, and I think Stephen Hurst, Councillor Stephen Hurst, is chairman of HOSC. You signed it on behalf of HOSC. That letter's gone off. But I'll yes. update you and circulate everything. But if if a task and finish group was um, proposed, you'd have to have a, a very strong um, scope and document of what the outcomes would be and what benefits would that be would be locally. So. I think we were a little bit away from, from that. And I think we just really need to see what the, the response is nationally. As Sarah said, it wasn't a local decision. So really to um, to a task and finish group, really to do something on a national level would probably not be an appropriate um, course of action. I hope that explains everything. Yeah. Thank you, for that, Steve. Yeah, thank you. As you know, you know, uh, the majority of, of, of the people, uh, councillors within my group are new councillors. So that, yeah, thank you very much for making that clear. Thank you. OK, thank you. Are we any more comments? Well, I hope you've all enjoyed then this morning's very interesting session. We've covered a lot, but then again, there is such a lot to cover in adult social care and communities. And I want to thank all our contributors for um, engaging with us in such useful ways. Thank you. Um, and also thank you to members for such interesting questions. Um, this is a, it's a, it's a wonderful subject. It's an all engaging subject. And I hope in, the, in a fortnight's time we'll continue the interesting discussions we've had this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Lisa, you've raised your hand. Sorry, um, the meeting that's on the 6th of July, will that be a WebEx meeting like this or will that be an in-person meeting? At the moment, we are anticipating it will be a WebEx meeting, Lisa. We haven't heard Excellent. anything different. Um, Not that I... I don't want to see you all. It's just <laughs> you know, um, traveling to Gloucester all the time is less. Yeah, I think it will be a WebEx, so certainly because it's two weeks away, um, and it's a non-decision making um, uh, scrutiny committee. But if we hear anything or receive any updates, I would let you know immediately. Immediately. So for the moment, assume that it will be a, a WebEx meeting. So we've got that yeah. meeting on the sixth of July. The meeting after that is the seventh of September. Now, that may be a different scenario. We may be back in Shire Hall for that one. And the meeting okay, so is, no, is very much on an ad hoc basis at the yeah, moment. Yeah, at the moment, and under govern, government guidelines. Yeah. So 7th of okay. September, then 9th of November. Okay, I just could I just add, throughout the year, there are also, we mentioned this at HOSC, at Health Scrutiny, there may be um, a, a desire and, and an inclination for a joint meeting with HOSC on shared matters of interest. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you once again. Have a good day.